What's up, everybody? Greetings. Opening up the video game, because that's the one thing I forgot to do. That's the thing, I normally don't open the game when I'm playing on PC. To <gasps> it's going to flashbang me, I forgot. Thon's little snake hand veins? God, no, it's, it's Mesmer. Sorry. Okay. It's Mesmer! Ah! I knew it would happen, but it doesn't stop it from being any less painfully. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Even when I'm not looking at it, it hurts. Uh, bam, go stop, dude. PC, listen, this is my hot take. PC gaming is automatically worse than console because on PC, you get triple freaking quadruple goddamn flashbang for a solid 15 seconds of your existence. And on console, you don't. Okay? Okay? I've been avoiding DLC spoilies. I'm gonna be very real with you. We are hunting lore. Everyone is discussed. Everyone. Every... We, we've stared at the trailer quite a bit. That is your warning, suffice to say. Like a little, like, you gotta be careful. <laughs> you know what I mean? We literally talk about, like, everything current. I'm, like, up to date. I have been obsessing over this fella. So, you know, like, I'm just warning you, if you're avoiding DLC stuff, please be cautious, because there is a distinct risk that I pull up the trailer because someone says, I found something, and I go, ooh, and then we all open it up together and go, hoo, 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 and, you know, look around, you know what I'm saying? Honestly, I, I'm a little I'm a little offended you thought I would have a Radon emote. Then again, I might have a Radon emote where he gets like spray with water or something. You know? Whoa, this main menu's loud, isn't it? Hello everybody. How's it going? Hope you're having a good Sunday. There we go. Oh, it's bright. Not Radon Rikard. Oh, that makes more sense. Stride dex build, strength build makes it easier. You know what I'll say about strength versus dex is in my opinion, I've been on the record as saying this, this is not news for me, but generally anything that does really high stagger in this game is strong. There are dex weapons that do very high stagger. I should say posture damage, stagger, whatever you want to call it, you know. So strength tends to kind of have that on lock. Almost every single strength-based weapon will do more stagger damage because the point is that it's a weighty weapon that does stagger. But a lot of AoE stuff comes... Uh, not AoE. A lot of really high stagger comes on these Ashes of War that are on decks. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Uh, what I'm trying to say is not every dex weapon is going to be really strong. There are some, like, Bloodhound Fangs, right? You can't see it. Wait for it to load in, and Bloodhound Fang, one of the strongest weapons in the game. Does a lot of stagger damage despite largely being a dex-based weapon. It is also a curved greatsword, but it's really the Ash of War, the inherent bleed, benefits. You know what I'm saying? Unsheath, yep, unsheath, and, uh, what's another, oh, oh, what is it, what is it? Okay, uh, when you do Vagabond Start, your sword has this. It's not unsheath, it's like something stance or whatever, that does so much stagger damage. Very powerful early on. Ashes of War are the great equalizer a lot of the time. Once again, Nebula. Square Off, that's it. Thank you. I couldn't remember the name. Yeah, Square Off does so much stagger damage. Um, spinning Strikes doesn't do stagger damage, but it's it does really high poise damage. I think there's a difference. Basically, it'll stun the dude a lot if a smaller enemy. So you can, you know, change. It's it's almost like they get comboed in the spin. Almost every spin in this game, I feel, does a lot of poise damage. You just get completely stunlocked by them. It's pretty funny. But anyway, that is easy mode in this game. Anything that does stagger. Spells are really strong, but also a lot of spells do stagger. It's really the range benefit, but range won't always serve you well. So you still got to have something else going for you. It's just interesting generally how... <laughs> The game has its balance. It's also really unbalanced. Like, look at whips. In PvE, it feels for me like a cha like it, it's a challenge run to, to play with whips. It is miserable. I had, like, maxed out whips fighting a, a mid-game boss, and someone's like, what's wrong with your w weapon? And it's just like, 
this is whips, baby. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoo. So it's not balanced, but it's pretty balanced if we're talking PvE. You know, do you want to use strength? Do you want to use dex? Do you want to use magic? Do you want to use faith? There's something really, really strong in every category. There's also a lot of stuff that falls by the wayside and feels like From has never tested it um, or perhaps uh, wanted to create challenge runs with just using basic weapons. It's L2 in ring. It's true. Ashes of War are very strong. They, even when they were weapon arts in DS3, which obviously they operated a little differently, but they were really strong then too, you know? Unsheath works, why not square off? Oh, uh, you know what? I don't know DS3 weapon arts very well because I've pretty much used like three weapons. And the difference with Ashes of War and weapon arts, of course, is in DS3, the weapon has a weapon art on it. You can't change it. So... I'm just sort of giving background for those who haven't played DS3 and Ashes of War. You can almost always change your Ashes of War, move it around a little bit, barring the special weapons. In DS3, you're stuck with what it's got. And um, if you only use like three weapons like I do, because they're the only ones that you like, you won't test many uh, weapon arts. Um, is this a stream? It is a stream. We do be streaming. Should be on great swords too, like in DS3. That sounds really strong, huh? Anyway, um, yeah. So today, gamers, we're gonna be hunting for lore. I'm not gonna do too much of a preamble today because I want to hop to some loring for sure. Um, not that the lore is much different than the preamble because it's gonna be a lot of talking. But the issue is that um. Uh, I won't be streaming for too long today. We're going to have to end a little bit earlier because I got an appointment tomorrow morning. And then the next day, I also have an appointment. And I am really good about not sleeping. And by that, I mean I, I'm i going to need to go to bed a little earlier. <laughs> so we're not going to be, I'm not going to stream as long today, but we'll make up for it next time. Stamp sweep and stamp thrust. Honestly, in DS3. I don't even remember what weapon art is on... I use the Goddard Twin Swords. That's my weapon. Weapons, technically? It's like two hours? Not quite two hours, but you know, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll call it... Every time I say I'm going to do a short one, I end up going for long, but still. You know how it be. Piercing fan, but not square off. <gasps> oh, no. Roger. So we were talking about Roger. Um, the real fun part about Roger and D is effectively not talking to them is what keeps them alive until, if I'm not mistaken, you progress to a certain point in the game, they die anyway. I don't know. I know they die. I know Corin and D, if you never speak to them throughout the game, at some point in time will simply vanish and their bell bearing will be there. Pretty much the sign of NPC death. So... Yeah, that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of the fun part of this game is that if uh, you don't talk to people, they will live until they don't. <sighs> There's really no winning. That is one thing about DS1 that I kind of liked in a way, but it's really depressing. Is that you don't if you don't need to um, if you don't send people on quests, they pretty much rely on you for information, such as. Um, Oh, I forgot Dark Souls, Dark Souls 1's fire guy's name, the pyromancer, the really sweet boy, not... I want to say Lawrence. It can't be Lawrence, can it? Full-time streamer, yep. And at this point, YouTuber, heck. I do be YouTubing. It's pretty pog. Typical FromSoft story, and then they died horribly? You know what's even better sometimes? Is that sometimes it isn't they died horribly, it's that they died sadly, which is honestly worse. Like, the death is perfectly normal, you know? Like, Roger died horribly. He's a good example of died horribly. But D, he just kind of died normally. He just sort of took an L, you know? Why do they call him D when he do be taking L's, etc, etc? Um, but yeah, like... <laughs> In Dark Souls 1, you can keep people alive, but you have to keep, their from, keep them from their dreams and prevent them from making choices with all of the information and you hold the information back from them and you effectively infantilize them because you decide what's best for them. But if you tell them the information that you have, 
they're dead. And it's it's the most heartbreaking thing. I still think Dark Souls 1 nails that. I don't think the other games do as good a job. That's one thing that's... Dark Souls 1 really sinks it into your head. It's heartbreaking. Vegas Moxie, thank you so much for the sub and for six months in advance. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Enjoy your butterfly and your emotes. Thank you. Can I get some raft snakes in the chat, please? Did Roger even die or suffer a fate worse than death? That's an excellent point. He's just sleeping. I like how they give you the letter so it's a separate drop so you don't miss it. Laurentius, thank you. I knew it was Lawrence, but not quite. <laughs> Listen, I know that we like to make the jokes about George R. R. Martin naming every character in this game after himself, but let's not forget that FromSoft has a really wonderful habit of using the same names with maybe a couple letters swapped throughout their games. Laurentius uh, appeared in Dark Souls 1. Lawrence was a main character in Bloodborne. We have Yuria, or Yuri, or maybe her name is Carla. I'm gonna be real with you. I get them all confused because one game is a character named Carla who acts like a character called Yuria from a different game, but then there's also Yuria and then there's also Yuri who appears in one game. So there's Yuria and then there's also a different Yuria and then there's also a Yuri. Um, and then there's Carla. There's a couple Carlas. I get all the Carla Yuri is confused. I'm gonna be very real with you. Anyway, FromSoft loves doing what they do. <laughs> Now, I'm not even I'm not even talking about Elden Ring. I'm talking about the games where George R. R. Martin was never involved because I feel like folks don't know. Understandably, if, if Elden Ring is your first entry, I'm not trying to be like, huh. But trust me, FromSoft is very good at recycling names. Cinder Carla. Yeah, um, there's a Carla with a K in Dark Souls 3. And there's a character who is exactly like Carla, who I believe is named Yuri or Yuria in Demon Souls, but I, I think, you know what I mean? Like I'm getting them confused because they're literally the same character, but in different games. <laughs> uh, Yuri is in DS3. Yeah, but there's also a Yuri or, or a Carla in Demon Souls. And there's also a Yuri with an E in the end instead of an A in uh, Bloodborne. Although she isn't named, she has a name, but it's sort of, you know, we found that out through, I don't know how actually, cause she's not actually named. Yeah, so Yuria is, in Demon Souls, is pretty much the same as Carla from DS3. You know? Wait a second, did I miss something? I'm sorry if I forgot to say it. Like, yeah, yeah, Gwen, uh, Gwyn, really? All the Gwyns? Yeah, 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 exactly, you understand. Oh my god, Tsar Nikolai, I forgot to say thank you for the Prime! Oh my god, I'm so sorry, I was really distracted and I forgot to say thank you. Thank you so much, welcome. Thank you for the sub, please enjoy your Raft Snakes and other emotes. Perhaps it's a historical archetype? I mean, the main thing about them is that they're both witches who are treated badly because they were born with an affinity for dark magic, but they aren't inherently evil. They just despise themselves because they were raised to despise themselves because things associated with the dark are considered bad, but they are actually the kindest characters in the game. So it's not really a historical archetype so much as it's a FromSoft archetype. Not to say that they invented it. <laughs> But what I'm trying to say is like, you know, they like to reuse things. They always like to reuse things. Yo! Now I don't know what to now I don't know what to call you. Should I should I call you the should I call you the Kevin or should I call you the Rob? But thank you so much for the was that Thank you for the gifted membership. Cause history, that's why. I mean, yeah, but, you know, and hang on. Uh, Aries the Great, thank you so much for the Prime. Welcome in, I really appreciate that. Please enjoy your emotes. We got some excellent Elden Ring emotes. I'm just guessing that folks here are fans of Elden Ring. Um, so we got, um, I mean, my personal new favorite. It, he's just my newest uh, darling, Raph Snake. But let me just tell you, this is like my favorite because also it's... <laughs> <laughs> you do the wiggle. So please enjoy um, that emote of my boy Mesmer. Some alerts here too? We sure do be having alerts. Yeah, I still have to tweak them a little bit, but YouTube do be having alerts. They're just a little delayed compared to Twitch alerts. But that isn't even on my end. I set them up the same way. It's very strange. Yo, thanks, Nervy. I appreciate that. 
What's Elden Ring? Well, it's a sequel to Dark Souls. That's what Martin, uh, George R. R. Martin said. He told me. Have I gotten all of the sacred tears that I can? This is definitely something we need to keep an eye on. Either way, today we're going to be exploring Altus. Definitely continue with that. Lyco! I have done press this button. Where are my chips? You tell me where your chips are. There perhaps was some sort of incident with the chips, eh? <laughs> Lyco, thank you so much for 35 months. Jeez, we're getting up to three years, poggers. That's freaking poggy woggies, gamers. Can I get the Ralph Snakes in the chat, please? I just love seeing them. <laughs> no, they don't arrive till the 26th to the 28th? That sucks. Actually, let me know how the how the um the chippies end up. I'm very intrigued on the chip status. Watching P finally play Armor Core 6 today. Hang on, I'm gonna, hang on. I, I'm, this is a joke, just for the record, this is a joke. I am joking, I am making, I'm doing a bit. I'm putting on my gatekeeper hat. You know, the gatekeeper hat. It's very close to a dunce cap, but it's not the same, okay? Imagine it upon my dome. Um, um, but did he play release patch? Um, was he playing release, though? Because, you know, Baltaeus, you know, he got nerfed, you know, so... <laughs> Actually, in all seriousness, I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he downpatched or whatever the heck it's called. Come in here with pre-nerf Redon flexing? Um, I beat Redon uh, pre-patch with no summons. Um, so... <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> remove the gatekeeper hat. Throw it into the garbage cat where it belongs. Garbage cat? Garbage can where it belongs? <laughs> Marlo in shambles. <laughs> Anyway, I'm totally kidding. I'm just, um, I'm really happy Peeves, um, playing it. I may have given him some shit about not playing it on release. Just a little. I don't think I've been to Eleanor's church yet. And that should be active. Unless, do we do that? Do we do that this playthrough? Or did I just edit the first playthrough where I did that the other day and now I'm getting confused at what I've done in the game and what I haven't? Let's find out! Balteus was nerfed. Balteus was fixed. That was that was the bit. Balteus was accidentally uh, they doubled his missiles. It's a very similar situation to Radon on release, where his hitboxes were not working the way that the, that FromSoft intended, and they fixed him. Um, so it is what you would call a nerf, but it's what FromSoft intended Balteus to be. If you look at him now and you look at him on release, the missiles are insane <laughs> like when i when i fought him in new game plus after the patch i was like woof they really seriously accidentally doubled the missiles eh it's really funny though. okay anyway i'm not talking about armor core 6 because we're gonna have an incident here and i want i need to i need to have my full attention on the lore you might notice there's some sort of figure perhaps on the ground looks familiar everyone knows this is uh, officially the unfortunate conclusion to Yura's questline. But, in a way, it seems he achieves his goal. So when we come in here... Uh, I believe when I did this in my first playthrough, I said, Oh no, he got Simoned. <laughs> and I gotta, I gotta give myself credit for that joke, because when you play Bloodborne, Simon ends up exactly like this. Spoilerinos, I guess. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. She talked about an old game. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> it's real sad, though. Not you, Simon. Different Simon. <laughs> oh, man. Dummy, though. Is this not Simon, though? Okay, so, of course, Eleonora does not come in until you actually talk to him. But when you do... That out of the way of the shot. Also, my nose like all the blood everywhere as well. <laughs> Eleonora. It seems I am no match for you, but I've learned a thing or two myself. You see, I've sliced the finger off. the 
the cisplat no longer. Do not stain the immaculacy of your soul. Your flesh. Your flesh. And then... Good night to Yura. Interesting, so the trigger is picking up his gear? Or is it time? I'm actually not sure. But it happened the moment. So here we go, we got Eleonora. She uses Dragon Communion spells and Eleonora's pole blade, so named for her. She is a violet bloody finger. I'm still not certain of the significance of that. But either way, do some fire. Do some dragon. Come on. Do some dragon. There we go. Roar and fire. <laughs> Perfect hitbox though, eh? You know what? I deserve that. I was playing with her. She's being a little rude. So I want to talk about Yura's dialogue. It's just, of course, I have to deal with her first. Do the Ash of War. She do be roaring, though. Chompies! Oh, that's fire. I thought it was chompies. Oh, dear. That is way bigger than I thought it was. There we go! The Azure Boar! Beautiful. wears the uh, Drake Knight set. She, it's, ma it's basically what we like to call the Monster Hunter set, what I like to call the Monster Hunter set, because it's literally made of dragon parts. She wears dragon parts upon her form, and she uses dragon communion uh, incantations, which means that she has eaten dragon hearts. As part of Yura's quest, he talks about what happens to those who eat dragon hearts. It's actually part of the introduction in fact, if I'm not mistaken, it is some of the only information that we get about Dragon Communion in the base game. We get uh, this idea that if you eat dragon hearts, you gain the strength of dragons. It's, it's this mighty primal strength, but eventually the hunger for dragon hearts consumes you. And inevitably, through other item descriptions, we learn that the result will be to be punished by being turn, turned into a magma worm. The inevitable fate of everyone who consumes dragon hearts is to eventually become a magma worm, to crawl upon the earth on their belly. Now, it's really interesting because if I'm not mistaken, I can't think of which item description, but in Dark Souls, they make a big deal out of the idea of snakes being failed dragons um, who are unable to fully enter this, this form of primal strength like dragons are like peak and snakes are often depicted as trying to be dragons but are unable to be and the main thing about snakes is they crawl on the earth on their belly and with eleonora we have that aspect but she's clearly not a magma worm so the question is and based on yura i get the idea that she consumed dragon hearts and then perhaps as a way to try to subvert her fate of becoming a dragon, becoming a magma worm in this case, because it's not a full dragon. She started consuming, or she joined uh, Moog and his bloody fingers, becoming, according to Yura, their mightiest, the violet bloody finger with a very special title. Um, and then, now this, I'm genuinely not sure if this comes as a consequence of Yura's cutting off Eleanor's finger. Um, that's actually one thing I want to bring up as well. When he talks about, I cut the finger off, he means hers. Because the way that the bloody fingers work is it is literally Moog slash the formless mother's blood that is injected into your finger. Vare does it. And it transforms your finger, changes your eye color, and if you look at the symbol, which I don't have yet, but we will acquire it. Um, in fact, we should do that soon. Let's do Vare's quest. Yeah, I, ho I, I don't think it's too late. Well, anyway... Um, the, the finger 
that you use to invade is literally your finger. A lot of the other fingers are other people's severed fingers. Like, these are not our fingers. But the bloody finger is. So, basically, he cut it off. Now, the thing is, she shouldn't be able to invade. If you lose the bloody finger, you should, you know, not be able to invade. But also, it should, apparently, according to Yura, what he's learned, free her from, from being... Yielding to the cesspit, as he calls it. So it should also free her from the control of Moog. And then she drops this, the purifying crystal tear. A crystal tear forms slowly over the ages where the earth tree's bounty falls to the ground, can be mixed in the flask of wondrous physic. The resulting concoction purifies the curse from Moog, Lord of Blood's terrifying rite of blood. So from a gameplay perspective... Yo, Furious Taco Sauce, thank you for 11 months! Welcome back! Thanks so much for that! Thanks for the support! Glad you're enjoying Graf Snake. Uh, Eleanor is also reused from stuff named. There's an axe in DS3 called Elian El Eleonora. Yeah! Yeah, I remember that actually. Now you mentioned it. Another reused name. Um, oh, his outfit says something that indicates love. Could it be he went easy on her He died and died because of it? I honestly think it's more she is really good. So, the vibe I get from Yura is... Okay, she is the mightiest of the Bloody Fingers, according to him. She is, she is an incredible fighter. I wonder if they were peers. Now, keep in mind, I've never looked super closely at Eleonora's uh, model. Maybe someone who has can tell me. Is she around Yura's age? Yura's an older guy. He's got gray hair. Definitely, he calls himself an old man, if I'm not mistaken. He refers to himself as older. Eleonora... Once again, I only see her when she's trying to murder me. She doesn't look older. So I don't know their exact relationship. It could be romantic. It, she could have stopped aging because of something she did. She could be his daughter, something like that. They could not be related at all. I definitely get more a sense of, like, obsession with her out of him, though. Could be they, um, he was her mentor. I don't know. All of these things are possibilities. Um, right, you don't get Yura's outfit. I, I just went over this mentally. Yeah, you get his Nagakiba, but you don't get his outfit because you get that later. Manus Bros, remember having a heal being kind of underwhelming? It's not great, yeah. She's younger for you, the Kara model, but by the way. that Thank you. I figured, I figured. So, basically, his whole quest line introduces us to some themes but then it also gives the concept of we learn a little bit about cessblood as he calls it the bloody fingers and we learn about dragon communion was on laura's finger maiden um there isn't really any sign that she was a finger maiden is a really really specific thing do you know what i mean um just being a maiden in the lands between does not equal equal finger maiden We don't get her garb either, I forgot. We get her pole blade, though. This is all just a bunch of weapons. Where is it? Yeah, it's a really long katana. Um, do we get- we do get her pole blade. I'm just like... I can never remember where weapons are in this game, let me tell you. There it is, right below the Nagakiba. Okay. This is the Nagakiba. Is actually huge. It's, uh, I, it's, what is it in Dark Souls 1? The washing pole? <laughs> what if she wanted to fight Moog? That's why she had that purification thing? It's really hard to know much about her, um, her status and what she wants or anything. Because she does invade you and she kills Yura, who cares about her a lot. So, it, you kind of really wonder about that. Um, I did want to talk about this, though. Once again, from a gameplay perspective, what this does is it allows you to cleanse knee heal so you don't take damage during the actual fight um, with Moog. Um, you just stop him from using it effectively. It doesn't affect you anymore. It breaks that curse. It's, uh, it is possible to defeat Moog without this. I did that because I didn't realize what this did. I forgot about this by the time I got to Moog. But even then, when I got this, I assumed that it would cure your bloody finger status. And I didn't know if I wanted to do that. Um... However, it doesn't work that way. It, this sounds almost like it's a cure, right? Like this to me, when I read this, I was like, 
oh, if you put on your wondrous physic, it fixes your, your vampirism or whatever, right? It's not what it does. But what I'm getting from this is I wonder if Eleonora was a slave to Moog's will in such a way. Right? I wish it were cure the, cure the bloody finger, but then you lose it. <laughs> Called the vial of bloody finger? I'm personally of the opinion we, we don't know yet. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to jump too far into it. Violet. There's other violet things. It could have something to do with another affiliation of hers, considering she seems to use multiple things. Um, but yeah, another thing. The reason that I think we might indirectly find out more about Eleonora is the DLC. Of course, people are talking about. Oh, Mesmer is Dragon Communion eyes. Yeah, he sure does. He seems to be perhaps the origin of Dragon Communion in the first place. So. That's kind of um, that's kind of the the thing that I'm wondering is maybe now that we have another figure who's associated with Dragon Communion, do we potentially find a little bit more about her? I wonder if Yura didn't have the wrong idea about Eleonora. Um, though Yura seems like a good dude who wants to help you, I wonder if he didn't, you know want Eleonora to follow the right path. He didn't want her to sully her sword and her flame as well. And I wonder if that's the dragon flame. Because even though Yura doesn't seem to use anything associated with the dragons and helps you hunt them, he talks about the majesty of dragons and how mighty they are. So I don't know if that's what he was referring to. I think he just doesn't like bloody fingers. So he doesn't like that she has gone in with them. And from Eleonora, considering she kills him, I... It's either it's possible she's under the control of Moog, or it's possible that she doesn't agree with Yura and wants him to stop hounding her. Both are possible. Um, she wasn't planning to kill Moog or something? It's possible she was planning to kill Moog, for sure. Uh, we just stop her from doing so. Then again, we don't know that she's actually dead. We do get her weapon, which is normally a sign of, oh yeah, she's dead. But it's not certain. Sorry, let me... There we go. Here's the pole blade. Okay, first of all, the Nagakiba. Katana with a ferociously long blade, signature weapon of Yura, hunter of bloody fingers. Reminiscent of a reinforced spear, its imposing length can be put to good use with powerful thrusting attacks. So we don't get more information on Yura until we get his garb, which comes later. And unfortunately, it also talks about Shabriri. Still. Um, Eleonora's pole blade. So... One thing I'd like to talk about, this is this is going to go into some Bloodborne information. Doesn't she invade your world? Yes, there is precedent for invaders not dying after they after you defeat them once. And we never find Eleonora. We don't also get her, her outfit. The outfit tends to be the FromSoft signal, hey, they're gone. There are exceptions. For example, not everyone drops their gear. Uh, Yura doesn't drop his, even though he's dead, because there's a little bit more to his quest in the form of Shabriri. So, there, it's not like a hard and fast rule, but generally we can kind of, you know. Pole blade hilts are similar to a certain Sekiro, the Black Blade. Yeah, I de look at the Lotus. Yeah, it's 100% Lotus. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the Pole Blade, because there's a lot that I'm seeing here that relates to another questline in Bloodborne. And once again, we've talked about how FromSoft likes to recycle their concepts, their ideas. I'm not saying it's the exact same thing, but let me give you the information, and maybe you guys will be like, oh, that tracks. So, in Bloodborne, we have a quest line. It's not a direct quest line. It's actually a little bit more big picture stuff involving some characters. But there is a character that we encounter who had a... It's In this case, it's Garman. Garman was an old man, the, the first hunter. He's very OG, and he had a student. He mentored a student that was his favorite. And she was very, very talented. But eventually, she effectively gave up on being a hunter because of, well, we find out why. But the hunters did some pretty nasty things, and she gave up on being a hunter. Her status is yet unknown. There's some implication that maybe she self-deceased. Um, but either way, she is no longer present in the base game as far as we know. Um, Garman was obsessed with her. Some people take it as romantic. I honestly don't know. Generally, though, he deeply missed her and was devastated by her leaving. And 
he well he created a doll that looks like her <laughs> it gets a little weird but here we have an older teacher and a very very talented student and uh well the student goes against their teacher um with honestly pretty good damn reason so i wonder if there's a little bit more to eleonora and perhaps a little bit more to yura because here's the thing about yura whether it's his own control or not he ends up succumbing to the to the flame of frenzy we don't know if he chose that i know cut content all i know from what we have currently in the game is there's absolutely zero mention of frenzy flame with him and then he shows up as shibiri's host did shibiri take his body did he get infected did she, did yura choose this we don't know we have no concept. That the Bloodborne doll was based off Maria? Yeah, this is all I'm talking about. So, another thing that you might be like, okay, yeah, but that's just a coincidence. Eleanor's pole blade literally looks like the Rikuyo. Maria's signature weapon, the student in this case. Maria uses uh, a weapon that is very similar to this, but can also be broken into two. It's not the same, nor does it have the same moveset, but it's eerily similar and she is known for using dexterity but also blood she has very special blood and uh, she hated it in fact she never used it but she will use it and in her boss fight she uses flame and blood in other words blood flame just like Eleanor's pole blade wasn't in Bloodborne it wasn't in Bloodborne's base game all right, so Twin Naginata, forged in the land of reeds, chosen weapon of Eleonora, violet bloody finger. Her mastery of the sword was such that her onslaught was likened to a whirlwind, but now her legacy is stained by a curse of blood. All right, that's pretty much it for that. Blood flame is such a cool motif. It is. It really is. So I personally think the dragon communion came first. And then, for some reason, she became a bloody finger. Now, we also know people can be turned into bloody fingers against their will, but it, this suggests that she chose it herself. However, once again, why does she drop the purifying crystal tear? Is it possible she was trying to take out Moog? We honestly don't know, if you ask me. We don't have enough information about Eleonora. Um, we don't have enough information about Yura. But the way that he talks, it's... I have my issues with uh, with Yura. I really like him, but there is this weird... There's a slightly weird Garman vibe from him, isn't there? Cut dialogue, alluding to something taking over. Having it would have taken away from the surprise scene again after watching him die. Yeah, I mean... I don't know. I'm, I don't... I haven't seen the cut content, so I can't compare. But it was cut for a reason. I think they wanted to, to change... But that perhaps they're changing how Shibri reworked. Yo, Northhold! Thank you so much for the gifted sub! I appreciate that so much. Thank you for the support. Orgasm, enjoy your your butterfly and your emotes. Hello, Vari. I don't remember where I am in your questline. Be sure to try that oh. finger. There's no re but tarnished. Your loyalties are misplaced with them. That's where I'm at. That's why I was waiting. I wanted to do... This. Hey, thanks, Northhold. I really appreciate that. You two first played there has been so good. I'm so glad! Nothing I've seen in that cut frenzy stuff contradicts the game. But we don't know why I was cut. Time constraints, always possible. But I don't want to... I don't want to assume because when we assume, like, it's not that it contradicts what's in the game, but it could contradict something that, like, they changed their mind on it. We have no idea. Right? So what if, because the idea of Shabriri behaving like a parasite that takes over is quite different from this concept that we have with, um, with Shabriri appearing to behave sort of like a demon. The thing about demons very often in their depictions in various media, not always, but very often, is they don't lie. Um, they will manipulate, withhold information, tell you what you want to hear, but they will not lie. Because 
demons tend to be contractual beings, so they can't lie to you, but they can sort of tell you a weird, twisted truth, right? So the idea of Shabriri behaving as a parasite slowly whittling down his host is very different from the idea of a demon who somehow ends up as with Yura's body. And I wonder how much of it was like, oh, we don't have time, and how much of it was actually, let's make him a little bit more demon-like than this depiction of parasitic behavior, right? Um, so maybe they cut it because it was too obvious. I really think there are a couple things that I saw in the network test that they cut because they were too obvious, and th these are just lines of dialogue. Or uh, item descriptions, I mean. And that doesn't take any time, so why did they cut text out of item descriptions, right? That wasn't a development issue. That took no time. They literally removed text or changed it. So it's not always a time constraint thing. It can't always be justified as, oh, they wanted to, but they ran out of time. And because of that, we want to be careful with our assumptions, you know? You can save your maiden just to destroy the planet first. Exactly. He's not lying. He's like, oh, your maiden, it's so sad that you have to kill her because you do. It's all true. All of it. Okay, so we're going to do this real quick. This is, of course, Magnus the Beast Claws World. So this was added, um, I don't remember when. I, wa I want to say like six months or even later post-game, maybe even a year. But this was added quite a bit later as an offline way to do Vare's questline. So you don't have to invade three people. So you don't have internet connection, whatever. So this is going to allow us to progress his questline. Shabiri still lives after you inherit the frenzy. He becomes a summon for Godfrey. Oh yeah, Shabiri's still around. He would... He likely doesn't die, period. Yeah, he kind of sucks. I'm not biased or anything. I just freaking hate Beast Claw stuff. Also, because of him, you can actually now get two... Uh... Oh my god, that was a terrible roll on my part. You can get two uh, of his weapons. I don't remember what they're called. I always forget. Star, whatever. We'll get him in a sec. Ugh. No! <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be bold. Runark, Furla calling Finger Reno. And then wait till we return to our world, and we should get the Dropperinos. Great stars! And a Somber Smithing Stone 6, Pog. Oh, chat, does anyone know where I can get a Somber Smithing Stone 7 without too much difficulty? I'm trying to stay as close as possible to where I already have been. <laughs> greed never punish? It's not greed. It's not greed. It's boldness. When you're doing PvP, even pseudo-PvP, with against a little a little NPC dingus, you gotta be bold. Because a human brain never expects it, and an AI brain doesn't know what to do about it either. Volcano Manor or Nocron? Volcano Manor Manor would be better. One by the Tower and Kaelid? No, that was a uh, an eight, so I misremembered. But it, it's also better than a seven, so but I still need a seven is the thing. One past the god skin. We might do Nogron then. Average Elden Ring Invader NPC, 50k HP, that from saw balance. I mean, to be honest, A. Um, technically, we were the invader, so that wasn't an invader. Well, actually, um, we were a bit. Sorry. <laughs> nah, but, um,. I like that NPCs are a challenge. I wish they were a little harder, to be honest. Like, you might die to them a couple times, but you know what I mean? Like, I wish they beat your ass like they used to. Hmm, back in my day, NPCs would gesture at you, and they would kill you, and they would stab you in the back, and then they'd do a little dance. And I'm not kidding. I do, I really miss the personalities of NPCs. I do wish they bring that back. I was really hopeful, but they didn't. There's still time. Great stars! Huge bludgeon with three stars at the striking end. Though primarily a striking weapon, the star spikes cause blood loss. A bloodstained star is an ill omen, a fact not lost upon those against whom this weapon is brought to bear. Landing attack slightly restores HP. So, 
The thing about this is the Great Stars is one of the few weapons that directly references the Blood Star, or in this case, the Bloodstained Star. It's, it's definitely one of the weapons that is linked to the Blood Star. And then we also have, like, is the Formless Mother the Blood Star? I really wonder why they added this as Vare's target. Now, Vare's target, Magnus, uh, he uses a lot of beast incantations, so he seems to serve Garonk. That's how Garonk uh, thanks the people who um, give him death root, who help him, who serve him, including the vulgar militia. So I really wonder why they added that. Is is Vare, is this supposed to be like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, blood star and the formless mother are distinct? I don't know, because I really feel like they're similar. But I feel like there's an argument made for both. Hate NPCs in this game, the input reading is so obvious. The thing is, they're not that hard though. Like, yeah, they do, but it's like... If they're so good at improving, why don't they beat your ass more, you know? Like, where's my bloody crow? Where's my Maldron? You know what I mean? Like, I want them to make me suffer. I want people to write posts on Reddit. Like, bro, if you're an invader, screw you. I hate you. I got invaded by this guy named Florian. And then find out it was an NPC named Forlorn. And then they go, oh, LOL. Oops. I want that to happen in other... I want people... To, to suffer a little, because you know what that does? It's freaking funny. You look back on that moment where Maldron like freaking stabbed you in the back and you laugh your ass off. It's hilarious. Swung at Moongrum and he had a shield out? Yeah, but like he's the only one. Do you know Hazel is a nightmare? Nah. I don't think Juno's that bad. You gotta beat your ass a little bit. Bloodhound step. It's not the funnest combo in the world, but meh. Think it's a real player? Death makes it more fun. If you're sitting there like, hang on, is this a real person? Why are they why are they like gesturing me? What 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 that moment brings so much life to a game? I literally talked about how I think Dark Souls 2 does this really well because even if you play the game a hundred years from now, um, and you're playing offline and the servers are long gone and you're out there playing Dark Souls 2, you will get a sneak peek into the experience of playing that game online and getting invaded. Forever. It's very special. And I know it made people angry, but that's just kind of my point, dude. Some people just have no sense of humor. They take things too seriously. Hey, are you eating bodies, y'all? Honestly, oh yeah, that one sure is. That one's having a good munch. See that one right there? Oh, he hungry. Look at him. Look at him go. Yum, yum. Ice cream. Yum, yum. Etc. Etc. Anyway, I do wish Elden Ring had a little bit of that. It brings so much more personality. But yeah, what can you do? Juno does gesture. He's the only one, though. Alright. Uh, Vare. Let's do Vare. Spam the block button while two-handing? Yeah, they need a toggle, dog. They need a toggle. Mad Tongue Aubrey's gestures? Yeah, but I'm not talking about, like, they do one gesture and then you get the gesture and then that's it. I'm talking about the NPCs in Dark Souls 2. One of them would hide as a barrel and sneak up behind you. He would even follow you as a barrel. One of them would appear not as a red phantom, didn't have any sign that he'd invaded your world, and would simply stand there and gesture, he'd wave, he'd do happy emotes, he would show tons of personality, and you're just like, what, what, what? And then when you get to a bonfire, he'll follow you. And he's just standing behind, beside you, being completely non-aggressive, not doing anything to you. And the moment that you stand uh, next to the bonfire in the area, he will stab you in the back, doing a massive crit that is more than likely to one-shot you. It is the funny- and then, I'm pretty sure he does the emote after you're dead. It is the funniest experience I've ever had. Genuinely, it's the biggest highlight. A, a summon who shows up in your world goes... And then does... 
for the rest of the time is not the same as the amount of energy. Do you, mind, do you know the amount of people who took it personal that that happened? Do you know how many people go on and on and on about how Maldron's like the worst? There, he, this guy has, that, like honestly, that NPC has far more salt than I have in my entire invader career and I'm a little jealous. Oh, Lampkin, so pleased you're here. I'm glad that you're enjoying my gift. Mm. I knew it from the very start. You have a taste for noble blood. Yum, yum. <clears throat> noble blood. I wish to anoint you a proper inductee. A knight to serve Luminary Moog, the Lord of Blood, and establish a new dynasty. Luminary Moog has strength, vision, and of course, love. So, what do you say, my lambkin? So many people I've seen that have a visceral rage for the Dark Souls 2 DLC invaders. In general, they hate the invaders. Um, Forlorn, I think, I love Forlorn. Um, can they completely one-shot you and end your whole career? Yes, but that's funny, dude. You know what I mean? I love that Dark Souls 2 has offline unembered invasions. If anything, using an item, your humanity, human effigy, makes you not get invaded so you can avoid them if you really want to there are tools within the game to avoid invasions you just have to use them and i really like how that way you also get to encounter all the npcs um so i don't know it's just really neat oh right actually good point bruce i forgot to mention if you uh <laughs> sorry i think of maldron and i just i love him so much if you uh, attack Maldron, the, the NPC in Dark Souls 2 that I'm talking about, the one who acts very human-like, if you attack him, he immediately starts sprinting. And, of course, your instinct is to follow him. Um, I think he literally pulls a lever to open the door on his own. Or, if the door is open, he basically lures you into a trap and then proceeds to attack you with uh, a boss. <laughs> He is such a little troll. And then every time he kills you, every time. Emo, right on your corpse. And you're just like... <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's so amazing. Ah, all right, let's get anointed. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Who would have it any other way? <laughs> now, take uh, this. I'm not a weapons expert, no. Ah, this is what I was remembering. Final try. Soak the cloth with a maiden's blood. Normally, this ritual would involve killing one's own maiden. And but of course, you are maidenless. But since you are maidenless, what kind of car does a sheep like to drive? A lamb, Burgini. Will do. Very relevant to the lambkin uh, moment. Thanks, Chief Master, for the hundred bits. The hallway with the Legion of Predator Mask Invaders and Iron King. Oh, good. Oh, I love that. Why do we need a dead maiden? So, we are basically fulfilling a ritual. Now, you might be like, okay, uh, what, what kind of ritual is this? I think Vare is having a little bit of fun. I mentioned it previously, but now that we're actually doing the quest, I'll go over it again. I think Vare might actually be trying to get you to do what he has done. He is literally asking you to follow in his footsteps. Now, the reason I, I think this is because if you talk to him, he talks about the round table hold, and if you immediately, without going to the round table hold, say that you don't want to listen to the two fingers, he gets irritated with you. So if the goal was simply to get people to join his, uh, his lord's dynasty, then surely he would be happy that he found someone like him, correct? So why doesn't he? I think it's because he is trying to get other people to fall in the same way he did. So by doing what Vare asks us to do, we are sort of doing, it's, it's like a symbolic journey. And I think because this man's rather self-absorbed and self-obsessed, he's trying to get people to do exactly what he did. And I feel like it's a way of not quite coping, but him sort of being like, ah, look, yet another tarnish does what I did. Um, as if proving that others are as depraved as he. So, 
the the main thing that happens is he tells you you go to Stormvale, you get a great rune, you meet the two fingers, and at that point he congratulates you and says, "Oh, but there was something not quite right about them, wasn't there?" And at this point in time, he also moves to the Rose Church, a place really, really, really um, bloody. Sort of uh, taken over. In fact, this is where a statue would be. It has now been completely taken over. So he sort of moves to his to his more regular haunt, and he tells you, wow, well, you met those two fingers, right? Were, do, were they what you thought they were? And then you tell him no, and then he goes, oh, well, let me give you another path. Makes me think it's like his his whole situation. It's a joker, one bad day thing. He wants to be justified in doing what he does, bring others down to his level. I agree. I, I definitely think there's a part of it there. Um, If you don't use the metal he gives you, you don't have to invade kill him. Not 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure either. I don't know. We might be able to, to check that. Are we going to visit Moog yet? No, not yet, because there's no real reason to go there so early. Probably impossible to code such encounters in an open world. I mean, you could just do it in a in a um, in a legacy dungeon. It's no different. They just didn't want to. That's one thing I'm a little disappointed in. But it's okay. Dark Souls Three didn't do that either. So like, I was just hoping they'd bring back one of my favorite features from Dark Souls Two. You know, but they didn't. It's okay. Do we know if he killed our maiden? Mm, maybe. Probably. He's definitely a strong contender. We don't have like the. 100% guaranteed, but he's perpetually covered in blood, is waiting right outside the area, seems snow were maidenless, and is trying to get you to follow in his footsteps. I think someone killed his maiden, because another step that we go on now, we go to find a bloodied maiden. Pure white oath cloth given by Vare, the final trial to be anointed a knight of Moog, lord of blood. Soak the cloth with the maiden's blood, the blood of anyone's maiden will do. You are maidenless, after all. Let's go test some maidens. Vary is a whispering devil with slight suggestion. Mm -hmm. So this is the one I normally grab because there's a sacred tier right here. This is a Vike's maiden. We can dye the cloth of maiden's blood. Also, note that it isn't a traditional interaction. It isn't like you know, a, a click, observe, or something. It, it's a little different. Um, we can also use, if I'm not mistaken, Irina. In fact, that might be why Irina remains here. No, we can't use Irina. That's actually really interesting. This is partially a test for me, too, because I haven't done this. Uh, who else? I was going to try the the Chapel of Anticipation. There's a catch with Irina. You only use Irina if you actually kill her. Then made the start of the game. We're going there right now. Under specific circumstances. But what's interesting is we don't have to kill the other maidens, either. So that cloth and Melina's blood? Um, I mean, it's... The thing about it is that Melina is a spirit. So, like, she sort of really can't bleed, I guess. But when you summon her as a phantom, she bleeds. Yeah, who knows what's up with that. The phantoms in this game bleed. When you, when you, when you get summoned to another world, you are a phantom. Um... But when, yeah, it's just one of those weird things. She can burn, though? She sure can. And I wonder if it's not because she's burned already. Also, if a spirit can burn, it makes you wonder if... People are like, well, if this tree is illusory, the earth tree is illusory, why do you see ash in Ash and Landell? Well, apparently spirits can burn and leave something behind. So this one works. This is the one that people, most people think is our maiden because she appears right here with the note left for you. We don't know. It's one of those safe bet things. Is it a safe bet that Vare killed your maiden? Yes, especially considering his quest. Um, like I said, 
The point now is to kill a maiden. He wants you to kill a maiden. And he clarifies he would like you to kill just about anyone's maiden. Now, you don't have to kill anybody. But you can. Why do some we ever have a maiden? So it's one of those things, because in the game, usually, according to quite a bit of the lore, every Tarnished has a faded maiden. I might be like, okay, then where are they for all the other Tarnished? That's an excellent question. <laughs> it's an excellent question. <laughs> Even then, uh, some people are like, okay, so is Lanya Diallos' maiden? Maybe. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. We don't actually know. There's a lot of questions. Where are more alive maidens? I'm gonna be honest, I never kill anybody for various quests, so I don't know. Does anyone know what are any remaining maidens? Can Nephili count? I don't know, does Nephili count? I wouldn't kill her for Vare. If Irina is eligible, Hayeta would be too, right? I don't know. I don't think there are any live maidens you can kill for it. But, I mean, Arena's alive for a period of time, and if you kill her, it works. Could you use Juno Hazel's Maiden? So, Juno Hazel's Maiden... We get the Traveling Maiden garb, but we don't get... I believe it's just, a like, a burnt-looking body? Implying, perhaps, that Juno burnt his Maiden? I don't know, but I don't know because it, she looks more, like, corpsey. Definitely for a tribe outside the lands between... The thing is... The Tarnished are all... She's a Tarnished for sure. And the Tarnished all have Maidens. So she should have a Maiden. Hayeta is eligible. Okay. Actual Maidens is their garb on corpses, their dead bodies in churches, and Anastasia, who poses one to murder Tarnished. Mm -hmm. Dialos Maiden in Liurnia. I don't know if the body remains after you get that event. Let's take a look. Yeah, Theralina is a puppet. At this point, so I don't think she works. My opinion hasn't really been a thing since the Tarnish came back. Then I wonder where the whole lore about every Tarnish as a maiden came from. Because even we are allegedly a Tarnished of no renown. We have a maiden waiting for us. She's dead, but we did have one, you know. Don't think the pool of blood remains? I think you just need the body? I don't really know. I think it's over here. Oh, Lanya. Lanya. Yeah, nothing. This is, I believe, where she is. I remember it looking like this. Nothing. Is there really a Gideon's Maiden? We don't know. No Maidens and some Tarnish don't even see Grace anymore. Mm-hmm. So, according to Roderico, some Tarnish never see Grace. Although... Apparently, um, some people theorize that she isn't a Tarnish. I suppose it's possible she isn't one. But it is interesting that she has the same eye color as a very powerful female spirit tuner that Hugh ha owes a favor to. Clearly from the Lands Between. There's something going on there. I'm not, I'm not going to jump to conclusions, but there's something there with the eye color, and since she isn't gold-eyed, she can't be grace-given. Does that just mean she is royalty? She is a noble in her homeland, and she gets forced out. Now, some people are like, okay, so maybe she saw grace, or she never saw grace. Maybe she awoke as a tarnish, but what does that exactly mean? Because apparently, to awaken as a tarnish, you see grace, but she never saw it. So is there another sign of being a Tarnished? Also, if you awaken to Grace, and that's like a personal thing that only you can see, how come other people know? Because every single other Tarnished that we know of who awoke to Grace was forced out of their home, Roderica included. Roger doesn't see Grace. He ends up at round table hold after we talk to him. Is it us? What do you, what do you mean? Roger doesn't see Grace anymore, but he did. Could Fia have had a maiden? That's the thing. Presumably, all Tarnish are supposed to have a maiden, but they don't anymore. It could be how long it's been. It could be the Shattering messed something up. We really don't know. She has traveled from that grace, so she follows. The thing is, you don't have to 
travel from the grace in front of her for her to appear. So... We do have to, um, what do you call it? To get Roderica to move, we have to enter Stormvale. Whether we do her quest or not, she will eventually move. I believe it's if we go to the round table hold. I'm not certain though. It's been a while since I've paid attention to Roderica's movements. Is it possible spirit tuner? Sorry, I missed the previous uh, about the spirit tuner. Spirit tuner Hugh refers to as Marika. I personally feel like it's Marika, but there's just as much argument to made it someone else, right? Hugh only ever seems to talk about Marika. That's that's my personal interpretation. Yes, is that it's Marika. We know she's female either way, um. But that's all we know. And I, I also don't want to assume that Hugh only knows one human being. <laughs> so even though I personally think it's Mara because a spirit tuner, I'm leaving some room for surprise, new NPC. Or one, surprise NPC. Or, or two, um, we never find out. Ambiguity. That's also possible. I think it's Mara because since Mara would have golden eyes. Would she though? And before she became the vessel for the Elden Ring, did she? And if Hugh is someone very trusted to her, and would they potentially have known each other for a very long time before she became a goddess? Maybe. Maybe. Put money on Mikla being a spirit tuner? Oh yeah. Because his mother is. And there's a lot of evidence that what the parents do the twins can do very well in a really, really interesting way, actually. That means Patches had a maiden? The thing is, the only thing we encounter in this game is people without maidens. So it's hard to know what happened. Did everyone get their maiden killed? Did... I mean, there's a lot of factions here who seem to target maidens. In fact, there could be an argument for that's why Lanya's killed, is that she could operate as Diallos's maiden, thus you know, causing issues down the line. I don't know. They were called Maidenless by one dude who is kind of an asshole on a good day. Mikola and Melania can pull off a Rebus merge like their parents? I mean, I think they could, but would they? We, To be fair, we still aren't certain. Technically, I suppose they could, yeah. Sever owns the three wolves? Mm-hmm. Who knows if she had golden eyes? Exactly. There's a reason they hide Marika's eyes from us. We've Every time we see her, Mikola, Radigan for that matter, eyes are hidden. You can't tell eye color. There's a very good reason they do that. They want to keep us guessing. They want to keep that ambiguity because a lot of lore can be acquired from eye color. Uh, I actually wanted to see if I could take out this uh, death bird that's here. Although it's a death right bird, so this might be troubling. Hello. I don't remember where it is, but I think it's near here. Like here, maybe? Here, maybe? I don't remember. Melina says there's still bursts in this world. There it is. Hey, what up, baby? I actually wanted to kind of see it spawn in. It spawns... Isn't it interesting that the flame it spawns from? Oh, it's very fast. I have for gore. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Ow. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. My spinal column. Yep. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Isn't it interesting that the flame it spawns from is a different color from the flame it uses, at least from what it looks like? Mm, no, it's, it's the same color, but its wings look a lot more teal. Oh, my God. Don't walk on. Dodge. Oh. What? FromSoft has not quite nailed the rabbit hitboxes to this day. There's the death blight right there. The screen did death blight. That is interesting, but freaking weird. I'm not the biggest fan of death birds. I 
love that you can't see what their head is doing. Oh, here we here we go. Big attack. Very blue. Woohoo! All right. Look at the guys within the wings. Horrifying, no? They're all using that freaking Spearino with that steeply look. It's gonna explode! In fact, when it does the spear attack, it's conjured by those guys. God, I freaking hate Death Right Birds. They're so cool, but fighting them is such a terrible pain. Where are my follow-up goal? Not poggers. That's wonderful. No, my iframes. Oh my god. Come on, baby. No. So hard. Die. <laughs> Woo! Look at the wings before they vanish, and they're gone. Now, what's really interesting is the wings are like this black void. And the spirits stick out of it, all holding. Is that the health and steeple? I always forget what the spear is called. Ancient Death Ranker. So you can see this is the uh, basically advanced version of the Ranker Call. Um, but this one is an ancient death hex that was rediscovered by Necromancer Garrus. And actually, we should do this dungeon where we find Garrus. Because Garrus is, it's a dungeon with, I believe, two bosses, if I'm thinking of the right one. So... You fight Garrus, and he's very much a pinwheel reference. Like, genuinely, like... Pew. Ranker is from Dark Souls, or Star Wars. I said Dark Souls, I meant Star Wars. I mean, Ranker's also just, like, a word. So, technically, I would say it's from the dictionary. <laughs> Death Ritual Spear. Thank you. I always call it the Health and Steeple. It's a bad habit of mine. I just always... I'm like, the steeple! The steeple! The steeple! Anyway, yeah. The Death Ritual Spear. And they're all holding it. And that's where some of those attacks come from that come directly from the wings is coming from those guys. So, neato. Now, this ancient death hex was rediscovered by the Necromancer Garrus. There's a lot of enemies, or not enemies, sorry, but the the gear that you get from Garrus's dungeon is gear associated with the death bird. So I wonder if he didn't find a bunch of relics and keep them. Uh, it's where we get um, the Raven Mount Assassin garb. Now, this is the ancient death ranker, which comes directly from the death right birds, who are advanced versions of the death birds, and they're the ones with those immense wings. Sorcery of the servants of death summons a horde of vengeful spirits that chase down foes. Charging enhances potency. They are cinders of the ancient death hex raked from the fires of ghost flame by death birds. So. This is one very neat little thing, because you may be like, oh, cool, it's a sorcery, and it requires int and faith. A lot of int, actually. Um, neat. And you use skulls, that's pretty cool. These are cinders that come from, they're, they're ash, basically. Very, like, they're, they're ash. We literally use spirit ashes to summon spirits. So it looks like the death birds, they, they have this like kiln of ghost flame and they put bones and whatnot into it. And from those cinders, they take these, these ancient death hexes and they do the same thing that we do with these ashes. It's the same thing all the way down. It's genuinely really, really cool. Oh, Tibia Summons. I must have gotten this when I defeated a, a Tibia Mariner and forgot to read it. Once again, the Death Hexes require a lot of int. Summons a group of those lost in death. 
Three skeletons will appear some distance from the caster and attack foes before disappearing. The dead have long been left to wander. What they need is leadership. I love those lost in death. And I really wonder, is this meant to be those who live in death? Is it a mistranslation? Is it another term? I don't know. I don't speak Japanese. I can't read the original. I just gotta guess. But it's intriguing. I think we actually should probably uh, take out a few death birds because I just remembered about them. Nighttime spawns are tough because I like daytime better. The death related stuff feels very scattershot. Um, yeah, I, I really, I, like I said, this is a blind spot of mine. I don't look at, okay, I want to cast this. What do I need? Do I have the stats? What do I need to cast it, right? But I'm sure there's something to be said about why that is, and I'm really wondering. Maybe it's a term from the Tibia Mariner's point of view? Those who live in death, those lost in death, they seem conceptually similar, and based on the fact that, as far as I know, it only comes from one description, I'm leaning toward a translation thing. But if you ask me, the translation is really good. Leonhart uses the Ranker spell? Uh, oh, Lionheart? Uh, Lionel? Lionel? Yeah, he sure does. He is a... Servant of Fia. And it's interesting because I wonder if that is not the role that Godwin is taking on as uh, leadership for those lost in death. So it's possible that the death birds existed previously, but Godwin has sort of co-opted what they do, which is why now the death birds have this appearance. Now, I don't know that they didn't always look like that, right? But the fact that their skulls are cracking, they look very terrifying but also damage just as a as a basic start so i wonder if the reason that they have death blight involved in their scream is potentially because death blight has has affected them perhaps while the rune of death attacked godwin and turned him into this form that we see him in maybe the new form of the rune of death in the form of death blight is not attacking back i don't know Link between the Ghost Slime stuff and Death Blight stuff, the Prince of Death staff boosts those Ghost Slime spells. Yeah, I think that might be it. So I also have Cracked Skulls for some reason. Yeah, then I wonder if that's not what they're supposed to look like. Uh, Death Birds just don't look right. Maybe that's me being judgy. Yeah, I think, uh, I think Godwin might be the leadership that they're talking about there. If the death dead have been left to wander without guidance. So let's be able to get more NPCs in the round table hold. There's a fair number in the round table hold. The difference with the round table hold, I'll say though, is that in uh, in previous titles by FromSoft, your round table hold tends to have some enemies, but a major plot point. You're not your round table hold, your your hub usually tends to have a few NPCs, but part of it is finding NPCs to bring back and, and taking them to safety. Oh, this one is little stunted baby wings. Not as powerful, that's for sure. And without the flame directly on their bodies. Leadership you provide by finishing Thea's ending? The thing about it is I really wonder if Godwin isn't involved in that ending even if we don't see him, right? As the Prince of Death, he's gotta have some sway. Very long neck. This is the first death bird I encountered. The sacrificial acts. A acts. <laughs> Fia's her own mist that inflicts death light. One of them is a feature for death blood companions or if it's unique to her. It's called Fia's mist. So it's definitely a spell of her invention, but it was likely after she met Godwin. Perhaps because she took some of his power, but a big part of her quest line is the fact that she would like to give power to Godwin. So I don't know if she's taking power from him. I don't know. It's possible. Sacrificial acts. 
that's a bird. That's a bird with its mouth wide open as the axe. Hatchet used an ancient sacrificial rite. A death bird is depicted as a malevolent deity. The power of the rite yet lingers. A small amount of FP is restored upon slaying a foe. So, one thing I'll say about the sacrificial axe, and this kind of does suggest that there might be some validity to the idea that the death birds ain't looking right no more. Weapon to the right of the axe. Ice Rind Hatchet and Highland Axe. Okay. So that's a bird. You might notice that it has immense, a huge beak, a visible eye, and teeth. It also has a plume and is covered in, it looks like feathers, something adjacent. It's covered in plumage. And then at the back, we see tiny little wings. This death bird, if this is a death bird, and it is apparently a death bird, looks very different from the death birds we encounter. And I really wonder if that isn't a sign that they themselves have been changed. That don't look right either. They definitely don't look like what I would describe. Like if I were to draw a bird, I feel like I wouldn't draw it with teeth personally, but um, birds were dinosaurs, so you know what? Twin bird kite shield? Yes, I just don't have it yet. But that one, the thing about that one, I thought it depicts the twin bird deity who is even, who is like the one that controls the death birds. The death birds are servants. Think of the death birds. I'm not saying this is a perfect analogy, but if the death birds are two fingers, then the twin bird seems to be like perhaps the greater will or the elven beast, something like, right? You know? So I do want to talk about that one. That one gives you some immense lore. Lots of prehistoric beef birds had teeth as well as beaks. Yes, and uh, there's actually, you might remember, um, both in this game and perhaps transferred into your nightmares, is another bird in this game that has teeth. I'm not saying this is a death bird though, but uh, I'm just saying, we do have these little cutie patooties hanging out, don't we? So these ones, I, I genuinely believe, were simply um, changed due to eating corpses a la Bloodborne. But it is very noticeable that their bodies are huge, stretched. Honestly, ugh, I don't want to say humanoid, but definitely a little bit more like a human that became a bird. Now, FromSoft has a history of crow enemies and also people who became crows all the way back from Dark Souls 1. I'm not saying that's what's happening here, but it is interesting considering that they look like ravens or crows. And then we also have the raven mount folks who we're gonna encounter now, or at least the garb. This is like some Omega lore, so I'm gonna get this before I forget. I wanna go here. Says the deity is the mother of death birds. It means literally, sure they, surely they look similar. I mean, that is literally a death bird uh, on the on the axe, and it doesn't look like the ones we see, so it suggests the same thing. It really is interesting too, considering that the Glomide Queen is depicted as the mother of the Godskins as well. Oops. Do you guess when crow people used to be human? Yes, they worshipped Velka. That's why they're only findable in the Painted World, because they were basically pushed there. The Painted World of Ariandel in Dark Souls 1 operates sort of like a prison realm where unwanted things are, are placed. I personally think it's by Gwyn, and it's not a coincidence that a lot of things associated with Velka are tossed in there. Her worshippers, um, her weapons... Crow people were human. Some say they're Velka's children. The, uh, both. They uh, they worshipped her. And Velka, Velka, despite being depicted as a goddess of revenge, also has a lot of interesting maternal traits. Specifically with those children. 
Also, while the painted world is very hostile to us, uh, the ruler there doesn't want to fight us and allows us to leave, saying that this land is peaceful, its inhabitants kind. Not to us, but it's basically a place for unwanted people and things. And perhaps in that state they find some peace with one another. It's like a junk drawer. It's like a junk drawer that hides uh, things that you are genuinely terrified of, but you can't get rid of because they're too powerful. <sighs> Valka, baby. Kind of like Halic Tree? Kinda? Kinda. The Halic Tree is, is a place, sort of a pilgrimage, where unwanted things can go, but... The one thing I'll say about Mikola is I'm not certain he's quite as benevolent as Priscilla is. He might be, but he also might not be, no? Okay, I'm getting my ass beat right now. On that point, we shall see. I'm not even saying that Mikola's bad. Really? Like, I'm not- I'm not one of those- He's totally gonna go pure evil and become Femto! 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 I don't even know how to say his name, bro! It's totally gonna happen, bro! But it's just- The thing about Mikola is, while he seems to genuinely care about certain people in his life, I really feel like he will only help others if, uh, he potentially can get something out of it. Not in, like, a- like, a really, like, slimy way or anything, but I'm just- I- I can't help but think of that dialogue from the Phantom in, um... Oh, here we go, we're starting to get it. In Castle Soul, after you defeat the boss, you you can talk to him, and he basically says, Um, I'm sorry, we have failed you. Uh, now I will never set eyes upon it, your divine halig tree. And what that means to me is, because we have failed you, we are not allowed to go to the Halig Tree. So what that means is, if we hadn't failed you, Mikola in this case, we would be able to go to the Halig Tree. And that suggests to me a conversation with Mikola going, if you do this for me, you can come to the Halig Tree. But if you don't, tough titties. And um, we don't know exactly why? And I, I don't want to read too much into it, but it is very, very striking dialogue, so it's hard for me to forget about that. Then, of course, the Shrive Clean the Hearts of Men. Then, of course, the uh, benevolent, not the benevolent, the uh, bewitching branch. Mikola can compel such affection. You know, there's a lot going on that suggests that if Mikola doesn't get what he wants, he can make sure he does. We failed to make the Halig Tree succeed. I wonder, but what was happening at Castle Soul seems to have been something different to what Mikola was up to to break his own curse. Mikola has multiple plates spinning at the same time. One of them was the plan for the eclipse so that he could cure Godwin. And then when that didn't work, he's like, I solved the problem. Melania, you go kill Radon. If Radon's dead, we can do Castle Soul again. In the meantime, I'm going to go have a nap in my cocoon in the tree. So he was trying to break his curse, presumably. He was trying to break Radon's. Melania's curse, for the time being, was at least still the not causing her direct harm in the form of Scarlet Rod, so she was covered. So he kind of seems to have been break, trying to fix everything at once. So definitely the Halig Tree isn't doing well, but I think that's lar that's not because of what happened at Castle Soul. I think it's because Mikkel is gone. The tree is his child, but also his mother. He grew it with his own blood, so when he's not there to ride with, for more, with more blood, it starts to die. Also, I don't know who said this in the Discord, but I had this moment where I was like, how did we miss this? And as, I can't believe I never realized it. The reason the Halig Tree fails is because it's taken on Mikola's curse. Because it can't grow to maturity. Because it's fed with the blood of it, an eternal child. So of course it was never going to grow. It's literally going to be a stunted tree, just like he is. And it's like, holy crap, how did, how did I never put together the reason the Halig tree was never able to grow all the way, like the Erd tree, is because it was bl Yeah, right? Someone says this in the Discord, and I was like, how does something so simple, you know? It's so funny. This is why I love lore and, and collaboration and, and all this, is sometimes you think of something that to you is obvious, but no one else puts together. 
what happened to the sun? You see it sometimes, but the earth tree has totally superseded it. It's very bright, but also the earth tree is close. Could it not be as simple as something brighter is closer? Got pretty big though. It's huge. But when you look at it compared to the earth tree, you realize just how small it really is. Honestly, I wonder if Mikola's thing might not be simply a sacrifice. Because that's what Marika did. She sacrificed herself. But first, she caused great problems. So I wonder if Mikola will not follow in the footsteps of his mother. And that's why he's following them literally. Is he's trying to, to do just that. Okay, so I wanted to get these objects all together before I read them. Right here. This is pretty big lore related to the death birds as well. And with that, we are bird. Oops. Skeletal mask. Skeletal mask that tightly grips the face worn by the assassins of Ravenmount. This ritual implement relentlessly digs into the wearer's face, preserving, one human, preserving one's human instincts while dressed in imitation of the death birds. Robe crafted with the black feathers of a bird of prey, worn by the assassins of Ravenmount. A ritual implement for transforming into a death bird, if only by imitation, strengthens jump attacks. We are birds of prey, bringers of death. So it's interesting because the death birds, you know, they look fairly predatory for sure, but... Then we have the Raven Mount assassins. They're not dressing as ravens. They're dressing as birds of prey. Ravens aren't raptors, neither are the death birds. I know. That's actually what's really interesting. So they dress as what looks like, for example, black hawks or eagles. Although, I don't think eagles are raptors. I think they're like falcons. Uh, I think it's really just falcons. I don't know if eagles are considered under the same grouping or whatever i think he wants to be reborn from the cocoon i think he gave up on the cocoon i think he realized that it wasn't going to work which is why he's now in the land of shadow so something else is going on with that for sure i think he gave up on the cocoon his body is still there though but with the with the absent soul there's a chance something goes wrong with what's what's left of the body but it really does seem like Mikola has given up on the lands between. I really wonder. He doesn't have Melania doing anything there anymore. He doesn't seem to care about Godwin. I, I'm not saying he doesn't. But he doesn't seem to be doing much in the lands between anymore and has completely moved on from it. So I wonder, does his plan extend to the land be lands between or only the land of shadow, whatever it is? is? Someone wearing something similar to the feather garb in the DLC trailer? I, it's actually, it could be the bandit garb. Because actually, if you look at the bandit garb, it's literally, like the bandit garb is a starting class, the bandit, and it's literally the same thing, but with, uh, with a cloak on top. <laughs> Pretty interesting, huh? The cape and a leather garb underneath, it looks like. Oh, you're saying they wear the, 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 the thingy, but no, no bandit garb? Like they wear the cloak? I don't remember that in the trailer. I totally believe you, but... Where in the trailer, out of curiosity. Nicola and Melania are both suffering from stagnation in their own ways, for sure. I definitely think so. Okay, so yeah, the Raven Mount assassins, uh, once again, yet another group of assassins in this game. There are so many damn assassins. And hidden boss. There are two bosses in this place. Did I buy the Sentinel Torch? <laughs> Shit, I didn't. Okay. Um, I didn't plan ahead for this. I forgot. Oh, sorry. Someone asked also uh, if this is modded gear. No, nah, this is all basic. I don't have any mods active. This is completely vanilla. This is this is in the game. Everyone always asks that. It's really funny. It's not the most well-known gear. It's hard to find, and a lot of people don't uh, alter it. And then there's Necromancer Garrus, just chilling. He's not looking so good, is he? What garb is he wearing? Is that the sage garb? Is that what Gowrie wears? Oh, with his pet snake! Ow. 
Oh my god! I'm not oh my god, I'm gonna die. I wasn't paying attention. Oh! Cool, we got to show that. Bye, Garrus. Oh, spoke too soon. Family heads. When he uses the family heads, you can actually see the heads stand straight up, and from that come the heads. Same music as, as Deathbirds? Yup, he is a servant of death. And has altered the uh, the stuff that he's found. So, what's interesting, there are no Raven Mount assassins in this place, but we get the entire set, right? So, he has likely been studying death, the servants of death, everything to do with Deathbirds, all this stuff, and thus came up with his own sorceries. He's a necromancer. What's interesting, though, is this is, I believe, the only necromancer that we hear about. There may be one more that we hear about, but it's really just Garrus. Three bludgeoning copper heads attached to a handle by chains. Signature weapon of necromancer Garrus, the heretical sage. The heads were made to resemble those of his wife and two children. Familial rancor. Gently rattled the copper heads to summon vengeful spirits that chase down foes. The anguish of a spouse and children invites a cursed wrath. You gotta wonder, um, were his child, were his children and wife killed, and he was like upset about it, or did he kill them and that's why they're pissed? Because the thing about necromancers is the thing they need most is um, stuff to work with, no? Also, look how they're depicted. It's literally a head. They're copper, um, but the they're hanging upside down into per perpetuity. I don't have this skill to use it, but you can see how they flow. Actually, it's really great that you, you can't see it. Look at this. Even without the ability to cast a spell. It mainly uses int. That's interesting considering the fact that necromancers, it's often like a study of magic. So he is trying to bring uh, people back from the dead in order to control them. Probably. Likely. Doesn't the AOK sword also mention copper? I believe so. Copper is important. We don't hear about it too often. That was creepy. I love it. I know. Didn't know the Clean Rot Knights dropped Mikola Lilies. I just had one drop one. Yeah, they are uh, servants of uh, Mikola through Melania. It's also possible that the fact that they... Um, we know that the Clean Rot Knights march through Liurnia, so I wonder if that isn't the source of the Mikola Lilies that we have. Maybe they... Maybe for some reason they, like, spawn them or something. It would be weird, but it wouldn't be unheard of. They drop Trina's at least two. Do they? That I didn't know. I've never gotten that drop. Seems very pinwheel adjacent. He's 100% a pinwheel reference. So pinwheel, now besides being sort of the meme boss of Dark Souls 1, is actually really interesting. His plan, M M pinwheel's plan, was to steal a small piece of the power of death from Gravelord Nido, who is basically the god of death? Uh, for all intents and purposes. And he had, uh, there was a group of people who were trying to kill the gods. Uh, they're associated with the occult. There's only a handful of references to them and they are very hidden. But basically, even in the age of the gods, it looks like there were some people who wanted to kill them. I can't imagine why. Sheep sometimes drop budding horns makes sense. Pinwheels are really cool. The whole occult thing in Dark Souls 1 is like such a deep lore that it often gets overlooked.
Mikola looks vine-like. What about him? All right, so that one's really cool. Necromancer Garrus is likely studying death so he can become better at his job. We gotta go to the Shaded Castle, actually. Oh, we should also do Vare's quest. I don't want to check out any more maidens. I think we'll just we'll just get that done. Does Millicent count? Does anyone know if Millicent counts as one of the maidens you can get blood from? I'm not gonna hurt Millicent. I'm just wondering. <laughs> Radon is from the same land as AOK weapon and Mirai weapon? Radon? Mikola's tree? Oh, Mikola's tree. Yeah, it's very winding for sure. Is Fia immune to death blight? I don't know. I've never attacked her. But no, Radon is just from L Lyurnia. Are you sure you're not confusing with someone else? He's just like a, he's a child of royals. Budding horns being a relation to the crucible because they say something along the lines of those horns not being naturally occurring on the animals they drop from. Budding horns? I could have sworn we read those. Um. No, it doesn't say they're not natural. If anything, it implies the opposite. They're rare, but they do happen. It's the same as anything from the crucible. Things associated with the crucible will naturally grow extra horns. They, get, they typically bear no horn, but it's not a natural. Aokade is outside the lands between... Yeah, Aokade, but Verdon was born in the lands between the Urnia. Buddy horn? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe Elmer? Are you thinking of Elmer? Because, like, definitely none of the demigods that we know of, because they're all born in the lands between... Eridani uses when the Karian staves. You know what? I never thought to think of Lionel and what he uses compared to when we see him later. That's really interesting, actually. I wonder about that. All right, give me one sec. I'm going to use the restroom, and then we shall continue. One moment.
Hey, hello! Sorry about that, I also played with Marlo a little bit. And gave him some pets, he insisted upon it. <laughs> Yo, Raven! Please hold this for another month, thank you. Absolutely, please, I, I, will, I will hold on to this Prime. We love Primers, SMHMR Mar Prime, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Raven. Welcome back. Thank you for four months. I appreciate the support. Any primers? Any primers? Mod check? <laughs> These sweaters are my fave Pokemon. I love Gengar. Like, I've always loved Gengar. Who doesn't? Gengar's phenomenal, right? But I really, really... Oh my god, I can't talk right now. It's really good. I recently realized I love Gengar. Like, oh my god, I love Gengar. Yo, Zootropo, thank you so much for the sub. Welcome in. I really appreciate that. Yo, another primer? Are we going to start a primer flood? <laughs> Thanks so much, Zootropo, for the support. I really appreciate that. Enjoy your emotes. We really are, though. San Evades, thank you for the prime. Oh, my God. We mod checked some primers. And <laughs> Thanks so much, Senevades. Enjoy your emotes. Enjoy your butterfly and your ad-free viewing. Thank you so much for the prime. Haunter actually used to be my favorite, real talk. Um, but now I just love... I really... I don't I love all of them. All three, all three of the evos are super cool. Raph, snake. Raph, snake. Raph, snake. You like Gengar? One sec. A little... It's a sneaky one back there, too. <laughs> it's prime time for some primers. Okay. Sorry, Horaloo. We, someone mentioned uh, before I went on BRB. Someone asked if Horaloo is from Lands Between. Horaloo is from the Badlands. Which seems to be outside the lands between from what we can tell. I mean, we go with the entire lands between, so I think we can kind of cover that. Love Trico. Oh, Trico's so cool. I love how he's kind of little, but his tail is so big. I gotta tell you, in my perfectly unbiased and purely out, uh, objective opinion, Gen 3 had the best starters. I think really the thing about Gen 3 in Pokemon is that it had the most consistently good starters. Because I really like Snivy from Gen 5. And I really like, you know, Sprigatito and Fuecoco from Gen 9. And I really like Primarina, the final Evo only from Gen 7. But I don't really like all three, you know? The only one that I like all three. Okay, besides Gen 1. Okay, and Gen 2. Ah, oh, dang it! Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen 3 are also Pog. One moment, please. Oh, wait, hang on, I forgot. I can just... Oh, dang it, freaking... Mm. Goodbye! Sorry about that. It's a, little, it's a little late for the children to be up, isn't it? Anyway. Crybaby Pokemon from Sword Shield was cool. I didn't like the entry to the series. I didn't actually play it, Sword and Shield, so. What language is this Pokemon? Least favorite starters? I feel like part of my general dislike for Gen 4 and 5. And I don't hate them or anything. They're just like, I, I kind of like, eh. It's the starters. I'm not the biggest fan of them. Except Snivy. Just Snivy. Oshawott isn't bad, though. I like Gen 5 and Gen 4 just fine. It's just when I think of like, oh man, I can't wait to make my Pokemon team in my playthrough. I There's no one that I'm like really pumped about, you know? I gotta tell you, Gen 4, not a fan. I don't like any of them. I can't stand any of them. Piplup makes me uh, irrationally angry. Like, I don't know why. I think it's because Piplup is supposed to be under the category. Why did you do that? Are you stupid? <laughs> I don't even know he could freaking Don Blue himself. 
Samurai is decent but boring conceptually. The one thing I'll say about Samurai, and then I'm gonna stop the Pokemon conversation for myself because I gotta focus on lore and I'll get distracted, but you guys feel free to talk about Pokemon by all means. <laughs> is it's the only freaking starter, besides also now Fue Coco, who starts bipedal and ends up quadrupedal, and that is a breath of freaking fresh air. With all the freaking, hello, I'm a cute kitty, and then turns into muscles. Hello, I'm a cute monkey. Muscles. Okay, at least Infernape isn't muscles, but it's still a fighting type. Meh. Anyway, so uh, I'm just going to do this mine um, because, well, it's neat. But what's really notable of this mine, actually, and this is something we kind of want to jot down in our, in, our mental, in our mental journals here. This one is sealed off with a stone sword key. And the more and more I look at things that are sealed off with stone sword keys, I really keep thinking why and how and who. Like, there's something a little bit more to the ones that were sealed off. It wasn't by accident. Someone did that intentionally. You got locked in here as a laying down knight? Yikes. I agree with Gen 8, Volpine, 100%. Samurai is semi-bipedal? I mean, can it be bipedal if you swing your sword with one paw, but you're otherwise, like, just a, just a guy? You know? Whee! Stone's word key? Whoa, framey. Stone sword key. It is a li I just went in a big circle. Whoa. <laughs> Took me a long time to notice. I, I know where I went wrong there. Tarnish only ones that can use stone sword keys, and for most of them, you open have been opened before. Um, I don't know that there's any reason that others can't use it. I just uh, use stone sword keys. I just think that others have no will to because largely the lands between has become so stagnant that no one has any will any further. Very few figures have any will anymore. Morgot is actually a really, really notable exception. I like to give Morgot a special shout out because he, from the very get-go, was like, I'm gonna protect the Earth Tree. And when we meet him, he's doing the same thing. He's got a great power of will. I don't know. I really don't know. Black flame stuff is sealed off in Stormvale. Yup. Uh, a lot of dungeons that are sealed off, they tend to hide things that are like, hmm, that makes sense. The elevator to Kaelid that leads to the Great Jar, sealed off. Oh, you're alive. I am... Let me fix that for you. Like bears? I think that's, that's a fair, that's a fair point. But his skeleton, skeleton makes no sense for that. Poor Samurai. Golden Epitaph is sealed off. That's a good point. I wonder about the Golden Epitaph too. It's also possible. It's also possible that some things were sealed not to keep them away, but to keep them safe so that, you know... Like, what do you use keys for? You use them to lock something that you can later open. So it's possible someone was keeping that safe from uh, poachers. You would think maybe they would get a little better with making keys that um, don't fit all in the same lock, like they bought it at the freaking dollar store. But you know what? Who's to say? All right, so this is the troll sword. Troll hammer, sorry. <laughs> Mining tool of stone digger trolls used to crack bedrock. Trolls are descended from the giants, and these were supposedly once used as ceremonial smithing tools. In the distant path, smithing's considered divine. Um, we also learned that giants are the origin of smithing. I believe that's in uh, Hugh's Hammer, which we should have. We haven't been to Landell. Sorry, I'm getting confused with playthroughs. That's Hugh's Hammer. Now you might look at this and be like, this looks weirdly familiar. Have I seen this before? It's the fell god's freaking eye, is what it is. I wonder if the fell god isn't the origin of smithing in general, considering that's the giant's god 
and it's associated with giants, and it was considered divine. Perhaps the reason it was considered divine was it was an art that was taught to them by their god. The giants, I mean. Also, I always check for hidden walls, even if I know there's not one there, because I'm like, what if I find, what if I actually find a secret one? <laughs> Top secret. Oh. Flame kiln is a big smithing crucible. What else do you need flame for, if not the smith? Cecil body had the fell god's eye on it. Was it Jupiter? Oh, yeah. Jupiter has an eye on it. Famously, it's literally a giant perpetual storm. The eye of Jupiter. Is it the fell god's eye, though? I always thought it was a little different, but I mean, it could be a reference to that. I don't know. Oh, I forgot how big that is. I'm almost dead. Shot hitting the wall 50 times? Yes. Uh, before that was patch. I believe it's patch now. Use it up in the whole playthrough? Nope. It just right now is what I got, and my god, is it just way too freaking strong. God, everything in this game explodes. Relate a fell fire god with smithing and craftsmanship, Prometheus for one. Is he really considered fell, though? Prometheus is definitely a fire god. Because he gives humans fire, but I wouldn't consider him fell. Anywhere why this guy is literally made of stone? Nope. Not as far as I know. So we're in this troll with the bounce off? I don't think so. I feel like that's just a crystallian thing, but I don't fight this guy often enough. Great club, an enormous club of hard wood. Wildly hammering foes with the striking weapon requires no dexterity, only brute force. While it may seem sacrilegious, this weapon is said to be a withered branch of the earth tree imbued with holy power. Or imbued with holy power, this weapon will never snap. It's interesting that we get the troll hammer outside, even though he uses it, and it's said to be of the stone digger trolls, and then we get the great club from the boss. It's definitely notable. Oh my god, I completely forgot to do the other boss. I literally talked about the other boss in uh, that that cave we were in, and then I freaking blanked. But there's something I want to get first. Mining smithing stones and glintstones seem to slowly transform the miners into rock. I wonder if it's not their tools or if it's if it's being in the mines. Because glintstone, we know glintstone can grow on people. Uh, it seems to... Ugh. Um, It's a little bit like... Yeah, honestly, black lung, I would say. Something reminiscent to it. But glintstone, rather than that, it just it grows on you. It's, it's alive. Uh, and glintstone spreads, and effectively it can spread onto people. It can grow onto fireflies preventing them from finding mates, and I wonder if it doesn't do the same thing to people. The glintstone seems to possess them, in a way. Ones who paved the way for god slaying weapons? Yeah, and notably, Marika is a smith. She uses a hammer, and it's a smithing hammer. I think, I also think she's a goldsmith. I think she used, I think she was kind of multifaceted with her crafting, including spirit tuning and such like that, but generally, she was a craftswoman. Whoops. These tree sentinels are twins. I forgot this because it's been so long since I fought them. But you have to defeat both of them to get the uh, the drops and for them to be considered dead. Okay, I forgot you guys can make it through here. I was trying to talk about your lore. And then you freaking twinned me. Okay, that's what I get. That's what I get. You know what? It's deserved. This time, David Attenborough, while observing some animals, gets freaking chomped on. Hang on, that's a good joke. <clears throat> I used to not like glintstone, <laughs> but you know, it grows on you. What? Did he just say that? What's that guy's name in Fallout New Vegas? You're in a war and no talking time? Oh no, who's gonna tell her?
I forgot. I for Fantastic? I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's not Mr. Fantastic. His name's like Billy or something. Is it just Billy? I think he has a last name, though. Oh, they're coming! Butters! Koi A, B, and C scatter and leave the decoy behind. Ah! <laughs> decoy! Oh, it took me a second. I'm like, huh? Decoy? <laughs> Butters, thank you for 26 months. Welcome back. Fantastic is uh, in Helios 1 and very fantastic, but he's not Billy. That actually happened to Dave Ambro during the filming of his dinosaur series recently. Oh my god, you got freaking bit by a dinosaur, bro. So, one thing I neglected is actually reading maps. So, I'm just gonna skim over them because most of them are just like, Hey, Limgrave. It's... Got clouds. Um, it leads to Caleb, by the way. It rains a lot here. I'll just, I'm better, I'll summarize it, actually. Um, it's foggy, and it sinks because they don't know how to build. And they built a castle in a swamp because they're dumb. Also, Karian royalty. Um, there's a road. Uh, there's, um, there's a school. Royal capital of Langdell. Mount Galmir, shattering bad. Landell, it's a metropolis. It's got two. <laughs> it's got double ramparts. I was actually like, oh my god, bro, Attack on Titan reference. How many walls you got? <laughs> First time I was here. Mount Galmir, there's cliffs and the sky is scary. Billy Knight! Thank you, Billy Knight, yes. Kaled. Melania and Radon fought there. Dragon Barrow. The dragons live there because they were escaping the Scarlet Rod. Shofra River. The grave of civilizations that flourish before the Erd Tree. Just finished Tag on Titan. So many similar themes and parallels with Elden Ring. Yeah. There's a couple things in that that I'm like, bro, there's no way y'all weren't inspired by each other. Or the same thing. I'm gonna talk about Attack on Titan spoilers. Just, it's fairly recent, so I'm gonna, and it's not directly related, so I'm gonna, like, mention something here. Please stop listening for the next, like, 30 seconds if you don't want to hear. The moment where, uh, Emir encounters a creature that looks uncomfortably close to the Elden Beast, I was like, what the hell is even going on here? The fact that Emir, if I were to, to draw Marika as a kid, I feel like she would look like Emir. The culture that she's a part of looks like the Roman freaking empire. Although that's more like she's a slave to the Roman empire. But still, I was like, what exactly were these two inspired by Miyazaki and um, I forget the author of, of AOT. Anyway, spoilers over, but there's a lot going on with that. Thought of Mark? Same. Isayama, thank you, thank you. Yep, I, I blanked. I really, really wonder. Considering the Elden Beast 2 is uh, is very aquatic, not directly. It looks like a prehistoric being, but also a fish, like a coelacanth, but not quite. I wonder if it's if it's not maybe. I don't want it just because it's aquatic, because the aquatic thing, of course, I go like, oh, maybe the whole immortality concept with uh, the Elden Beast. I rolled bad. I was talking and I distracted my brain. Anyway, I was wondering if it's like the Nino, same as Godwin, right? So Godwin has become like a like a Nino because of that, but I don't know. I don't really want to be like everything aquatic is a reference to a mermaid. 
I think it's more the fact to show that they're otherworldly, a link between the sea and the cosmos, stuff like that. Are these just omen beasts? No, these are tree spirits. So, uh, best I can tell, uh, they were benevolent or natural spirits that protected the roots of trees, uh, specifically the earth trees or the minor earth trees, or really just the great root trees, but perhaps because of what has happened with the shattering, perhaps because of the earth tree influencing them, something, they're starting to get ulcerated, they're pulsing outward, they're, they're, they have visible skin underneath their wood, they've become biological and not in the sense of a tree they're like a mix of skin and they're 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 um pretty marred they've been affected by what's happening but i don't really i'm not certain if they're directly associated with the earth tree i don't think so i think the earth tree avatar is but the tree spirits not necessarily they could predate the earth tree malformed earth tree avatars i think they're distinct though because they look like nature spirits, the sort of, you know, snake, almost dragon-like beings. Thanks for spoiler warning. Yeah, I, I'm just, I, I'm going to talk about other games and stuff, especially FromSoft games. But when it comes to, like, anime that finished recently, I'll give a spoiler warning because, like, people might want to watch that. I just watched it. Um, I watched all of Attack on Titan very recently because I watched it, like, 10 years ago when the anime came out. And, um never watched it since so i got all caught up when the show finished and it was like you know neat so <laughs> really glad you're enjoying the first playthrough wait they're also hello castle hello picks up a water bottle is this a mermaid is this a mermaid no princess mononoke i sure do do you do play all those rune tokens no someone dropped them for me yeah, these are my forbidden secret runes. They seem like the tree root, the avatar's tree crown. They're also typically found on the ground. Actually, that's a really good way of putting it. They're very root-like. Yeah. Honestly, I think the reason they've become biological is because they are somehow involved with the process of consuming the corpses. Um at the earth tree roots and sort of getting them to be naturally reborn through the process of like death and rebirth uh but i think that's been interrupted now so now they're ulcerated and pulsing and skin's coming out and bleh, you know they become corrupted the earth tree avatars don't look corrupted right like they don't look what i would call great they're like hollow tree heads but honestly they don't have the skin or the biological aspects so they're quite distinct, but linked, you know? Some of them are rotten. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. What did I get from this? I don't know. Oh, the hammer. Not just the hammer, Wrath. Wait for it. The g Oh, it's a giant crusher. I thought it was a great hammer. <laughs> it was going to be not just the hammer, the great hammer. And then, you know, I kind of goofed it. No one is going to bother corrupting the janitor, I believe. I don't think they're janitors, though. Okay. Actually, yeah, are you... Not Princess Mononoke, but... You know, um... Uh, Spirited Away? In Spirited Away, which is a movie that's quite old now, so I'm going to spoil it. There's a moment where someone comes in and they're, like, to the bathhouse. Because it's, it's, it's all in a bathhouse. It's a very commonly watched movie, but I'm going to explain it just in case. Um, this guy comes in and he's, like, super gooey and stinky. And they're like, oh, no. And um, then he goes into the bath and it turns out that he is literally a river spirit that has been polluted by uh, garbage being thrown in. So when the garbage is all removed he's free and all the gooey grossness comes off and he flies away and he's a he's a he's a eastern dragon literally serpentine like the tiny little arms and legs but a dragon and he is a river spirit and he protects the river but when the river gets destroyed and corrupted so he becomes polluted himself and you can't even see him anymore so that's kind of when i saw the tree spirits i wondered if that's not what happened i wonder if they are not affiliated with different roots and trees and then something went wrong with them because of how they look also they look serpentine 
with tiny little arms and legs. Although, to be fair, their arms are actually quite big at this point. Um, also, they, um, I mean, of course, I'm going to think a little bit of, of Needhog from Norse myth who chews at the roots of the Earth Tree. Although, er, the Earth Tree, the World Tree. <laughs> but Needhog is kind of an enemy of the tree versus the tree spirits are tree spirits. They are associated with the tree. And when the tree is healthy, they are healthy. And when the tree is unhealthy, they are unhealthy. And those roots aren't, aren't looking healthy no more. In a realm of stagnation, the spirits are going to get stagnant themselves. So it just depends on your interpretation. It's really the tree spirit part that sticks in my head, though. Excluding the latest one, just won an Oscar. Oh man, I really want to see that new one. Yeah, on uh, they're on Canadian Netflix as well. I, I watch them on Netflix. One second, my cat is crying. This isn't what he wanted, he wants to play, but I'm gonna pet him a little bit. I miss him, he's being so sweet. Ah! My earbuds. Earth tree as a tree spirit is to great tree? Uh, the tree spirits, the tree spirits are definitely associated with tree versus the earth tree avatars are blatantly earth tree. So it's definitely possible. Hi. Hi baby. You're so sweet and cute and I love you and I know you want to play. I promise we'll play, but I'm sorry you always get hyper right during stream time. That's your Zoomy era. Morgoth summons a construct of the Crusher during some attacks. Right, we also we also gotta make an inventory of the weapons that Morgoth uses. Marlow is shedding like crazy. It is springtime. You know what that means. I gotta give him a groom. My god, so much fluff. I did give him a little, uh... What are you looking at? I did give him a manicure today. We trimmed his little nails. <laughs> they were too long. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. You're a good boy. He's looking at where he would like to play. Actually, he's staring at where he wants me to go to. He's okay with this. Like, you know, he's chilling, he's happy, he likes pets. Feel happy about the shorter stream? Yeah, for those who weren't there, I have to do a slightly shorter stream today because I got appointments this week. Uh, I gotta wake up early tomorrow, so I'm gonna turn in a little earlier. I also uh, still need to edit tonight. Or there will be a delayed episode tomorrow, we'll see what happens. Oh my baby. Yeah. Oh my god, you're so cute! No, oh, my little baby boy. <laughs> He's so cute! Uh-oh. I made the mistake of talking with a shedding cat in front of me. Fun. Is it time to go, bud? See, now he looks grumpy, but you know he's not. He's just posturing. All right, go on, bud. Go on. There, I got it. Go on, buddy. Go on, sweetie. Love you. <laughs> we'll play soon. We'll play soon, buddy. I'm so sorry. Oh, I feel. So, I actually feel so guilty when he wants to play. He always wants to play right around now, though. On days off, I, I play with him, though. One second, gonna close the door. Don't be a distracted little menace, okay? All right, I'll throw this toy one time. One time. One moment, please. Come on. Come on.
right, we back. I really do be super fluffed now. Camera, are you not focusing on me? Okay, we're good. All right. God, it's, some of it's my hair just sticking to my face underneath my glasses. You good over there, buddy? <laughs> okay. Thank you for your patience. Dear gamers. The other boss in Altus Tunnel. However, one thing real quick I wanted to do is actually get... Uh, we can fight Morgoth, the mini Morgoth, real quick. The one that shows up here. And I want to get the Sentinel Torch. Because I've actually never gotten to use it. But I'm really excited to try. Also, I think it's time to finally use some fire spells. What can I use? Do not have enough faith. Flame Sling, Old Flame. Uh, I know Catch Flame is really good. I don't know if Whirl of Flame's good, but why not try it? We never used it. And then we'll need a seal? Which I believe are weightless also, which is really nice. Wait, where the heck are my seals? All right, here. We have Dragon Communion. This makes them scale off arc, right? Yeah, okay. No. Um, scale with strength? No. Enhances God Slayer? I'm not going to use God Slayer. I think we're just going to use the Finger Seal for now. It's not the best. I forget, is there a catalyst? Oh, wouldn't it be Fire Giant's Red Braid? Or not Not. Not the weapon. The Doesn't the Fire Giant have a, have a thingy? Never fire that boss with the fight that boss with the torch. I've actually never done it without the torch, so I'm really excited to try it. Godfrey, Raph, respectful cat ladies. It's true. The one thing is, I would never, you know, do what he did to Sirosh in phase two, but, you know, still. The fire giant seal. It's really that easy. Thanks, Lyco. Yeah. Performing in band earlier, it was real windy. Oh no, with <laughs> with hair yeah, in your face. Or giant seal? Is that the one you get from Fire Giant? <gasps> the Golden Order seal too. So we can just speak in a seal, Renos. A formless sacred seal depicting the ceremonial observation of order enhances Golden Order fundamentalist incantations. Fundamentalism is scholarship in all but name. Scales incantations using both intelligence and faith. Really strong, I think, if you're using, I mean, not only Golden Order stuff, but stuff that scales off faith and int. This might be my very first time actually using fire spells. Well, technically, no. I used fire spells before uh, on my fire build, but I only use buffs. Uh, I mainly use weapons and stuff. I did use catch flame a little bit. But it's kind of outside my realm of expertise to use spells, so it's kind of it's kind of a bad habit. So this one is the Minor Erd Tree Church, and at its core, there's no statue, nothing. It's associated with the Golden Order Fundamentalist. There's a bunch of centipedes, golden centipedes here, and there is a tiny, 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 tiny little Minor Erd Tree here. Golden centipedes are really interesting. We talked about them before, but just a little once, once over. They are kept as a fetish by Golden Order fundamentalists, especially the hunt. Oops, sorry, I bumped the table. The hunters of those who live in death, and they're found near churches and similar. Once again, centipedes tend to be signs of corruption, so it's really interesting that they're a sign of worship, although it could be something like the, the vermin um, in that they crush the corruption. I don't know, but it's interesting. Yo, Eldritch Whiskey Bottle, glad you're enjoying. Welcome in. I wonder why it says formless. Um, you know, 
seals sometimes literally have a physicality to them. You can actually see the seal sticking out of my hand here. Did I pass it? My god, I'm so bad at finding seals. Right there, okay. This one literally has no form. Very much like the Dragon Communion Seal. Although, I guess you could say it has form based on the fact that it's like red glowy, but you know. Scoop a bunch of centipedes in their hand. They're the desiccated remains of a centipede. So it could have something to do with, because it's a golden, but it's a centipede, right? Do we know how the centipede is a sign of corruption? So keep in mind, this is just a general, like, they represent filth in, uh, in, J in Japan. Like, the idea of a centipede, vermin, creepy little critters, especially centipedes. Uh, it's quite possibly because they have this one centipede there that is creepy and red. And if it bites you, you gotta go to the hospital. And they're awful because they're, they're really, really hard to kill. Um... And if you, apparently, I, I learned this from my friends. My friend lived there. She, she taught English in Japan, as a lot of folks do. So she taught English in Japan for a few years. And she told me that they have those, these centipedes there. And if she, if she ever sees one, the way to kill them is apparently to consistently and thoroughly kill them is to somehow get them into a pot of boiling water. And I was like, why? And she was like, well, because when they die, they leave uh, like uh, pheromones or some sort of smell. They they leave they they like spray a goo or something that attracts more freaking centipedes. As a result, having one can often be a sign of more to come. And if you think about, you know, horse historical concepts of like where do centipedes and vermin hang out? They're predatory. They eat other bugs. So where other creepy crawlies hang out? So you know there's a reason there's a lot of uh centipede iconography not iconography but J japanese games often have like a creepy centipede boss it's a common theme it's something that they look at like a japanese player would look at that and be like ah creepy gross centipede corruption right so that's that's more like a like a cultural thing keep in mind this is I, i've heard this from other folks i'm not like an expert i'm not japanese i don't know for sure but that's sort of like a like a general examination of this concept um but here to be fair it is the remains of one and showing the remains of something that you've killed potentially that might be why it's a it's a sign it's like i have taken the centipede and i have cleansed it or something it could be one of those Ape and Sekiro had a giant centipede in it? Yeah, so in Sekiro, Sekiro makes very good use of this. The centipede represents immortality, but it's one of those at what cost things, because it's very disturbing when those immortal beings pop out with giant centipedes all inside them. Talking about royal revenants, we are not, but the fact that they have multiple limbs is definitely, in my opinion, supposed to be evocative of a similar concept. Um, the fact that Godric, I mean, Godric's a little bit more tree-like, of course, but the big one for me is Rikard. Those tiny little hands that pop out of his body the, and his sword, it looks centipede-like, but if the centipede parts are made with hands. Another sign of it, um, the pest, the pest priests, I always forget what they're called. The, the, the creepy guys who look like a mix of shellfish and centipedes. Wonderful example, again, of what they represent. Kindred of Rot, thank you. I always call them pest priests or pest threads or that's their spell. You know what I mean. <laughs> okay, I'm waiting here because Melina will talk to us here. And this is really important dialogue that I don't quite know where it fits yet. So this place is the Minor Earth Tree Church and seems to be linked to fundamentalism. This is one of the big ones, one of the big dialogues that make me wonder... Is Melina always speaking for Marika, or is she possibly sometimes speaking for Radigan? I don't know. This item is a, is a nascent butterfly at a grave. And the sanctuary garden here, uh, sanctuary guardian here is just chilling, kind of being sad. We're going to leave him to it. But I just wanted to show that off. DS1 of the centipede demon. Uh, Bloodborne head headless bloodling beast, but also uh, had vile blood, um, not vile bloods. The, um, 
the Jolly Cooperation Equivalent Covenant involves you acquiring vermin, which are depicted as centipedes, and you crush them. So you see vermin, and you're able to, you, you become aware of them, and suddenly you can see them. And your job is to acquire them and crush them under your heel, but they will always, they were always there, you just couldn't see them type of thing. It's very creepy. So that's another big one. It's, they, they're pretty blatant about the corruption concept. Puss of Man's kind of centipede-like. I could, you could argue this centipede-like. And now you've got more vermin. Way to go, stupid. Yeah, yeah, they tried to cleanse it. To cleanse corruption, you, as a rule, tend to become corrupted, too. Um... Misbegotten in the corner of Weeping Peninsula, hacking at a dead corpse propped up against the first castle wall. There is a lot of enemies constantly attacking corpses, specifically misbegotten attacking corpses at, with a vengeance. Also, in the Fishing Hamlet and Bloodborne, very, very similar. There's a couple locations where you will see Fishing Hamlet villagers who were tortured by people, tortured to death, brutalized, their corpses marred, their heads cut off torn open and searched for eyes and the whole reason this realm exists is because of their curse put upon the people who did this to them you see a few of them just like the misbegotten constantly hacking away at corpses it's pretty interesting that one is alone pretty far from any other enemy oh i know which one you're talking about i'm just saying that we see misbegotten actually in lane dell similar that are doing that there's this one corpse and they're constantly constantly just hacking away yeah so, it's interesting. FromSoft likes to do that. Okay. Dialogue. Turn on your brains. Talk to Melina. Spoken echoes of Queen Marika linger here as well. I don't think Shall this is Radigan, by the way. There's something about my fellows. I, the one thing about Melinda's dialogue is she doesn't repeat it, and I understand why, but I have such trouble if I don't read it continually. So it's like I miss, I forget things, I miss things, so. Ugh. All right. I'm interested. In America's own words, I declare mine intent to search the depths of the Golden Order through understanding of the proper way. Our faith, our grace, is increased. Those blissful early days of blind belief are long past. My comrades, why must ye falter? Outer order. Nah, this has got to be her. Because we get law of aggression elsewhere. We know she originated the Golden Order. Oops. And had a great deal of faith, obviously. But it's really interesting that this was, you know, she didn't want blind faith any longer. Who are the comrades? When does this occur in relation to other things? This dialogue is very difficult to parse, in my opinion. Has her well as well as directly posed? I agree, I agree. It's just one of those things that we're, we're questioning our assumptions. We want to look at the dialogue with the possibility that Melina doesn't know she's being uh, inaccurate. But I generally trust Melina. And I trust her to know the difference between the two. Especially since I don't think that she's a child of Radigan like the others. So she would be less influenced by him. Although, you know, whatever. Inner Order is from D Brother. Yeah, so he is a Golden Order fundamentalist who hunts those who live in death. They are like the most extreme form of the Golden Order fundamentalists. Um... And that's where you get, you know, well, uh, law of regression. Wait, law, is law of aggression arms out with like this or like this? Like which arm goes up and which arm goes down? Because now I don't remember. I think it's left arm down, right arm up. It's like a little dance you do. Professor Rams in the house. Hell yeah. What's up, Justin? Just had Subway. Kind of hungry. Radigan has yet to become her for much of the story. Honestly, I think a lot, uh, I think that dialogue from Marika is actually one of the latest ones. Like, um, as in the ones that occur the latest in the story. So, I think they were definitely apart for a while, but for most of it, for sure. But I'm, we got a question, we got a question. Yeah. 
No, I definitely agree that this is Marika. But then who are her fellows? Who are her comrades? Are they the Black Knives? Because comrades... That suggests to me, like, equal... Equals. And she asks them why they falter. I don't know. I don't know when this occurs. Also, if this is a minor Erd Tree church, was it so forever? Because the Erd Tree is not supposed to have offshoots until the shattering. Because there were no eggs. Eggs. Seeds. The seeds sp specifically f uh, shot off from the Erd Tree. So that suggests to me that there were no minor Erd Trees. Unless maybe there were? But if there were minor Erd Trees, while the Erd Tree was still around, where did they come from? You know? Migla was here too, so that's weird. Why do you why do you say that? Possible, but what's what's the evidence? Is it the nascent butterfly? Triple Rings of Light has the same motion as Discus of Light, not the law incantations. Uh is that the one that uh which is the one that Radigan creates? Right goes down, left up? That tracks! So wait, outer order is left hand out? Oh man, now I'm confused. <laughs> Nason Butterfly goes Mikola? Yeah, but it was placed there. And it's on a grave. So it could be someone who followed Mikola or cared for Mikola. It's not floating around. So while the Nason Butterfly seems to represent Mikola, definitely. I'm not sure. Okay, we, we people seem to have this idea that everywhere he stepped... Uh, Mikola's Lily spawned behind him. So now if we got this this boy who walks and uh, flowers bloom and butterflies appear. And I'm a little jealous because I wish I did that. I wish when I walked like some sort of ethereal fairy, lilies appeared and butterflies appeared. But, you know, whatever. Um, is the nascent butterfly literally where he went? Or is it just a sign of him being in the... Like, you know what I mean? More his influences to spawn as the butterflies? Yeah, no. I'm not saying that he wasn't here. I'm just like, you know, a butterfly on a corpse. We see butterflies um, on corpses in the woods surrounded by those death blight worm faces. Is it possible that Mikola was there? Yeah. Mark Catfluff. Is it also possible that he... People worshipped him. For example, the, the worm faces, maybe they were like, oh, please cure Godwin so we can be not like this anymore. I'm not even sure if they have any awareness, but you know what I mean? They seem to have some. They know what they've become, the worm faces, and maybe they know that Mikola can help them. But he's a god? No, he's not. He's an Empyrean. He has the capability of becoming a god, but he's not one yet. He's a demigod and an Empyrean, which is a plus up from god, but he's not a god, not yet. Lake of Rot is chock full of Aeonian butterflies, but I don't think Melania ever got there. See, that's the thing too. But the Rot is there and the God of Rot is there, so it makes sense. But also, smoldering butterflies appear to appear around flame. They literally are drawn to it like a moth to a flame. It doesn't mean Melina was always there, right? Or Mesmer, depending on who we think that relates to. Link the butterflies on graves to the connection between death and dreams. Mikla is definitely slumbering. So that does track. Marka constructed in vanity? I, I don't think it was in vanity. I personally, I'm, I'm coming around to the concept that she created him. But in the process of creating him, like, I don't think you get to choose the other half that comes from you. When a person is divided, assuming that's what Marika did, she created her other half. She created her opposite. And it, Radigan embodies the traits that are not hers. Like she, it's possible she intentionally was like, I'm going to take all these stinky personality traits and put it into my other half. That I don't know. Or maybe simply by trying to create something opposed to her, she created something that is opposed to her in every single way. Maybe it, it's, it's like a requirement. I don't think that Radigan was her perfect solution. I actually think that it was an, a consequence of needing a rebus. So she she did that to herself 
thus creating Radigan. But they also needed to be split for a very, very long time. Um, which is why they were also separate. Giants interfered in the creation somehow with their curse. It's possible that they cursed Marika before. Um, I don't know. I'm also, I've also been kind of rattling around the idea, what if Marika, while a Newman, was also descended from giants? We don't know how long the giants, uh, the giants seem to have always been here. We don't know how long the Newman have been here. They seem to have been here for a very long time, though. So presumably, now you might be like, but she doesn't have red hair. Yeah, but maybe that's why... Radigan despises himself because Marika doesn't. So Marika seems to not have that trait. It's sort of like if Radigan has a trait, we can guess that Marika doesn't have it because they're complete opposites. So if Marika doesn't have a trait and Radigan does, okay, we can kind of make a guess there. But I wonder if maybe that was the curse of the giants was sort of she had to kind of betray her own history because she she is part giant and that's part of the reason that Radigan has the red hair to sort of be a reminder. I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot going on. Marika Radigan be a lot taller if she had giant blood. It's also possible that she's I don't know, they they hated the giants hated short people. They did. <laughs> Both discus of light and triple rings of light were gifts to Radigan from Mikola. In return, Radigan gives back Radigan's Rings of Light. Someone with a Ring of Light expands out for me. Oh, I think the worst one, right? So those are Mikola's spells, which is why the, the little cleanerites, clean rot knights use the discus. There is that whole thing about how the giants cursed Marika, right? And I think some people think that that curse literally created Radigan. And it's possible. It's possible, but that would have been pretty, from from my read, really deep into the War of the Giants. Um, also, isn't it actually when she defeats the Fell God that happens? That's pretty far in to the War of the Giants. That's why I'm not certain that that would be the trigger of Radigan. It would explain why he's a complete foil to her. But the thing is, if he's a curse from the Giants... It's a little weird that he's such a Golden Order fundamentalist because that just makes him hate the Giants more. So it's a little bit weird that the Giants were like, I'm going to make a curse and it's he's going to have red hair and he's also going to hate himself. And it's like, shouldn't you make him like an ally of the Giants or something? <laughs> you know, like, isn't that like a bit weird? But it's also possible that the curse wasn't an intentional thing, that that's simply the form it took. You know, all of these are possibilities, I would say. They aren't consistent size. Yeah, we can definitely get lore from size and boss size and enemy size, but we can't be super certain because gameplay first, right? Happy with Ellen Beast being the final boss? It's very Bloodborne, so I'm cool with it. I wish she was maybe like a little bit more fun to fight or maybe that you didn't have to fight Radigan first because... I really dislike Radigan and I really dislike Elden Beast and having to fight more Radigan if you fail Elden Beast is just such a horrible situation, but you know. Thanks, Melina. Bye bye. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know when if Mara could create a Radigan, I don't know when it was. This is the same seal, but it's made of stone. Okay. He is very bloodborne. The whole seeker boss that comes out that doesn't like to fight, but fights when desperate, is bloodborne to a T. So I genuinely enjoy Elden Beast for that reason, but I just hate fighting him. And he's really annoying. And he's way too tanky, you know? Or they made a deal and didn't know the repercussions. Sorry, who? Oh, Radigan turned on them. Radigan turned on the giants. Um. So the thing that's interesting about him is we don't actually have any evidence that he was ever up there uh, in terms of the, the mountaintop of the giants. Weirdy's massive but runs away the whole time. He only fights when there's no other chance. Just like the moon presence, I would argue that the Elden Beast is not interested in direct combat and is not a fighter. They have power, but it's not in the direct 
one-to-one -one combat. So that's why they largely use spells, try to stay away from you, and let Radigan fight you first. It's not an uncommon sentiment that Torrent should be available in the Elden Beast fight. Yeah, the arena is too large. Is it possible we see Marika in the DLC at all? Anything's possible, especially since Marika does not appear to be there anymore when we, uh, during her, um, during the ending cutscene of the game, just the body, and there we have several aspects of precedent, uh, several instances of precedence that you can be there in body but not in spirit, not in like the sense of Godwin. But I mean, not not like the sense of Godwin. Radiant had a giant ancestor. I personally believe that too. It's just I, I'm sort of coming to this this realization that I think. Well, I think that maybe he had to have been born of Marika. I don't know. We kind of lose that like he was a giant, so we hated himself thing. All right, how do I? There we go. Okay. Cook him. Does this still hurt? All right, 379. 452. Not a big loss if we one hand, so we can weave some spells in there. I would like to get more somber smithing stones too, because I might want to try using the magma blades now. But they're they're plus, you know, nothing. I had someone drop these for me to preempt the question. They're the only, the only weapons I had dropped. Everything else I got by playing. The reason I wanted them is because they are farmed weapons. And I am going to sit here killing a bunch of enemies. But they fit with our th theme and our intended build. Giants on the thrones of Eternal Cities might be proto radigans In what sense? Um, I don't think I have a good spell for this. Um, what does this do? Yeah, I sure don't. But I want it. Oh, is it just gone gone? Oh no, it's down there! What? I'm out of juice! No! You! Straight up Blades of Chaos? Yeah. I'm not trying to do a God of War reference, but... Dual Magnum Blades, now we talking? Yeah, I want to switch it up. I know fire isn't going to be good on everything. But that's why I want to have the the... Blasphemous blade. This is this is like mixed physical, mixed fire. We we can we can adjust. Kratos and Marika would get along. He's a man who has a habit of killing gods. I feel like no. Okay, you know what? Screw this freaking beetle. I normally hit him with glintstone and then I reset. Uh, if you load out the game, uh, it resets the position of those. So I normally do that. <laughs> okay, I'm not fighting more god like this. Hang on. So this is a weird one. Morgoth appears as this guy. But after you defeat Morgoth, as this guy, the guy's still there. Oh my god, he comes out swinging. No respect. Maybe Mikola would make him like him. <laughs> oh my freaking gosh. I love, I love Morgoth so much. He's just so like, he's so, he's so chill, dude. He just sits there and like has a nice grand old time and you know, 
really makes you appreciate um, just how fun it is to um, get absolutely psychologically outplayed by a freaking AI, you know? Oh, oh, okay, okay, mm-hmm. That spell is so hard to dodge because the hitbox near the hands is just awful. It comes out so fast. Listen, I'm a Maldron defender, but this is ridiculous. Bitch does not stop r oneing So there's a giant crusher. I'm dead. Oh, I live, bitch. You know one thing I feel like we don't talk about enough? Um, or at least I don't? Morgai has a tail. I believe he is the only... He's a unique model. We don't see any other one with a tail. Any other omen. Any other being with a tail like his. It's got omen horns on it, but he's got a very, very noticeable tail. Moog doesn't, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember Moog having a tail. It's possible it's under the robe, I guess, but only Morgoth has the tail. It's pretty interesting. Like your analysis of the trailer, how Mikola's allure seems to have a really sinister tone. Most definitely. I mean, to be fair, we were already talking about how Mikola has sinister traits before everyone was. Like, a lot of people were like, hmm, hmm. Griffith? 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 And even folks who don't know who the heck Griffith is, like, I, I didn't know who the heck Griffith was. <laughs> when we were talking about Mikola, were a little bit suspicious by the concept of the bewitching branch and his apparently superpowered charisma for lack of a better term moog has wings yeah you're right he develops wings in his face too pretty noticeable isn't it would that make him part dragon mm, who moog i would think it's more related to the crucible it's possible it's a formless mother but i think both of them as royal omen also have a stronger link to the crucible and thus embody more animal-like traits. They're small, but he has them. In phase two, they become pretty big. I gotta take a closer look at his model. I don't remember the small wings. Crucible equals dragon? Eh, crucible equals all life. So yes, dragons. But every life came from the crucible. Dragons are close to the Crucible for sure. Also, giants appear to be with their red hair strongly associated. The color red is strongly associated with the Crucible. So yeah, the fact that ancient dragons use the... Um... Talk to Melina? Yeah, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. I haven't forgotten. I just really want to get to this dude. Uh, dragons have a strong link to the Crucible. That's that's such a... Oh, this guy! Ah! <laughs> Look at him go! He's a death bird! I'm not kidding. It looks so scuffed. Thank you, FromSoft. I love you. He's doing it again! <laughs> These enemies, for some reason, are coded to do, do this, like, a lot. So you'll probably see them do this nonstop. Never seen that? It's really rare, but it's really these guys, these specific ones, that do it all the time. How about the Berserk inspiration for Mesmer's helmet? Yes, it's uh, G Grin, Grim, Grimvold, Grimvald, some, some, some dude. It's a visual inspiration, but the thing is that Grim Dingus guy uh, seems to have really been the inspiration for a lot of Radon as well. And there's an origin, there's like a side story for Berserk that involves this grim, grim guy. Um, but in the cover art looks like, um, hi, customer. hi, hi. Uh, there's a, there's a art there that looks like Mesmer's helmet. And then eventually he kind of looks like he's got, um, 
Radon's kind of fit going on. They saw they dropped the Sun Realm shield. Shield. They sure do. Didn't get it this time, unfortunately. Bolt blessed with an incantation, the Erd Tree deals powerful holy damage once used by guards of the capital. Golden arrow, highly effective against those who live in death, unable to prevent them from rising again. Golden great arrow, imbued with an oath sworn incantation, which boosts the attack and defense of the archer and their nearby allies. Distinguished great shield, features sumptuous ornamentation used by the scions of great families. Due to their excessive size, these shields were at times seen as the hallmark of little lordlings who were too timid to earn a few nicks and scratches. So we get the Prophet set, actually. Grunbel, that's it. Sorry, I'm bad at names. How do you parry this flying gas extinguisher? Oh my god, that's such a good term. Oh, I forgot to read the perfume bottle. Uh, the art of perfuming was once jealously guarded in the capital, but after the perfumers were drafted into service during the Shattering, the art became widely practiced throughout the lands between. Dialos uses this shield and a whip. I was about to say this reminds me of Dialos. I'm going to be honest, I normally kill him so quickly, I actually didn't realize he uses the shield. Poor boy. That's wonderful and very relevant. Um. Okay. I, th I think I, was, I finished most of my thoughts here. Okay. This is very similar to... Um, Cor Corin's set, but not quite. Obviously, he is the wheel. He is a unique set. But just for lore about the Prophet, this is your starting gear. Blindfold of exiled prophets who foretold misfortune and were persecuted and driven from their homes as a result. Why hesitate if the path leading to the future is clear? Just close your eyes and walk. Prophet robe, and this is the key. The shackle around the neck warned passerby, passersby not to lend an ear to their sermons because they were exiled. Then we get the upper class robe, which I believe is what Raya wears. Embroidered, bright green robe worn by noble children. Donning such a robe is traditionally the child's first show of burgeoning independence. Prophet trousers, made from rough fabric that scrapes against the skin like a sharpening file. Also, they it's interesting, Hugh is also wears a chain, but isn't truly imprisoned in the sense of not being able to move similarly shackled like the uh, prophet trousers are. Consort's trousers, fine white trousers, perfectly suited for wearing beneath a silk robe. Okay. Oh, the sentinel thing. I hope we aren't heavy from this, like equip load wise. We sure are. Well, we're not using these right now. We'll need to get some endurance, I think. You know what? I want to start using my stuff. It's time for a, a couple of forbidden runes. Yeah, deathray birds are the worst. A lot of enemies in this game attack incessantly. <laughs> and it's annoying. They're definitely one of them. The cheater runes. Yeah. A little bit of faith, at least one. Well, I want some endurance. This is a quick load, right? I'm like having a moment. Yep, it is. It's not going to help much. Although, now that I think about it, we might want to take off the sore seal, but then we'll need to probably level up our strength. Crimson Amber, I think we can take that off. It's good, but it's the weakest form. So why don't we put on Great Char instead? What we're using largely is pretty light, so we should be good. Okay, so now we can fight the other boss in here, but I would like to maybe try using the magma blades to start switching to a new weapon. <laughs> One in the urine that sends all those black wraiths against you? Oh, we gotta fight that one too. I, I was like, we gotta fight all the dead birds, and then I only fought two and I forgore. That's my bad. Rick, soldier of God. Mm-hmm. 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 The meme. Well, I took you now, man. Today, out your arms. Thanks, Hugh. Hugh also lacks a tail. Interestingly, the other misbegotten of his form have a tail. We gotta raise the finger thing. I 
I think I can buy fives now. I think it's in faith. If it's a death bird spell, totally. I just don't know which. I, I don't remember the name. I don't know what you're talking about yet. Maybe we'll go get it. Somber Miner's Bell Bearing 2. That should be it. I forgot to read Roger's drip and his note. <laughs> oh, I can't buy fives yet. That's my bad. I forgot. It's one and two and then three and four. That's okay. We'll get um, one of these. Favorite fantasy book series? I actually don't know. You think I would know because like, I, I like fantasy books, but it's been a long time since I've read what I would call like pure fantasy, like classic high fantasy. Auto playing through videos, see where I get. Happy land on your stream. Hello. That's pretty neat. It's like an adventure. We should probably get rid of the Baldekin's blessing. <laughs> Shared something you've written? No. I want to eventually. But I need to I, I want to write something. I want to write some fantasy stuff. I feel like that would have a good crossover with this community, realistically. <laughs> Sci-fi count? Sci-fi is basically fantasy but like cons i would consider sci-fi a, a subcategory personally but i i don't know I, yeah i would say so sure the boss yeah let's fight the boss okay sorry i'm just like mentally scrolling through things that i think we should do is it here is it Sage's cave. There we go. Is space magic just like gravity sorceries and such? Alright. What up, gamers? It's time to get freaking flamed. Are you ready? Gen genre labeling can become such a rabbit hole. It's true. I personally normally consider sci-fi and fantasy distinct. But you can have like a sci-fi fantasy. I mean, um, from what I saw, uh, Robert Jordan's work, The Wheel of Time does that a little bit. They're already kind of hinting at it. It's pretty neat, actually. Yeah, I, I, I think you could argue that they're related, but I personally always consider them distinct, yeah. Space fantasy? Yeah, because then we have, uh, isn't Star Wars considered a space opera or whatever? Armor 30k sci fi fantasy? I don't know. Okay, did I put on the torch? Oh, thank god. Okay. Where's she at, huh? I've never done this before. Oh my god! Wow, that helped so much. I'm so glad that I had the torch to, like, help me. Okay, it does help, though. <laughs> yeah, get torched, nerd. No! <laughs> Baby. Wow, this is so much better when you have the sentry torch. I've never actually done this with the sen- Okay, the magic of grabs. Like, actual BS, I'm just saying. You for the concealing veil, huge lore. No, but in all seriousness, 
a freaking phenomenal lore. I also forgot to read this. I opened it and forgot. Torch given to protectors of the Erd Tree. Its flames are bestowed with a special incantation which allows the bearer to see assassins cloaked in veils. Furnished on behalf of the Erd Tree and the grace given lord such that a knight of black knives will never come again. So. That's where they came from. It was literally an attempt to be like, not again. No more assassination. But if you look at the design... It's a little interesting, isn't it? It's freaking coiled, and there looks to be a silver vine growing up the, um, growing up the, 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 the torch, just all of it. Um, it's, it could be a tree or a, a fragment of the earth tree. It's also a freaking torch. It's really interesting that Morgoth gave these out to his soldiers when he is horrified by flame. Then again, he knows this flame isn't going to do much. Think this thing might be useful in the DLC? What's the dialogue in that uh, hero grave? Something shadows revealed in the light or something something? Veils equal Shadowlands for sure? Yeah. I personally love the lore of the Concealing Veil. I, I am of the opinion that Marika made, not to mention I love using the Concealing Veil in PvP, it's very fun. I think Marika made these. If she didn't, I think she knew how to make them because she too is a Newman. Um, now, these are worn. Part of one of the Concealing Veils, or let me read all of it, I'm just very excited. Talisman put together from dark cloth with a lustrous sheen, completely conceals the wearer's presence while crouching at a distance from foes. Part of one of the concealing veils used by the assassins on the Night of the Black Knives. So if you see the top part of it, it's like laced up with this sort of goldy colored thing. Like not the lustrous sheen itself, but the rest of it. Not to mention the fact that it's fabric. I can't help but associate it with the mimic veil. It looks, it looks, that part looks kind of similar. I definitely associate that with Marika. Now, I know the Concealing Veil, they're used by assassins, but the thing about the Concealing Veil is all that it does, that's not their weapons, the only thing that the Concealing Veil does is it hides the wearer and it protects them. They can use it to sneak and murder and do crimes, but things that are hidden, this is like my thesis. When I saw the trailer, the first thing I thought was things that are hidden are safe and that is the key marika hides things to keep them safe now i really like i know there's like this context of like a stealth sneaky stabby murder assassination but really she doesn't as far as we know create the weapons in fact someone mentioned last stream we were talking about this someone said that every incantation associated with marika not that we have any currently but all the ones that are, are healing or support. She doesn't appear to be one that causes harm herself. And I wonder if that suggests her nature. Despite her intensity and her power and... These are Abenarics. Oh my god. I never noticed. Huh. Kind of macabre. Do you think Garrus was doing this? Or do you think the Black Knife was simply hiding here? Because it looks like she could hide here for a very long time without being discovered. Anyway, sorry. I think Marika created these things, is all I'm saying. She was definitely a craftswoman. Um, she used a hammer, but I argue that she used many different creative arts. See their faded legs? That's actually what gave it away, yeah. We read Assassin's Approach. Yes. Is that a spell? I think I forgot to read it. No. Do I have it? No, I don't think I have that yet. Where is that? Ash of War. Silly me. I have a bit of a ha bad habit of not reading um, Ashes of War. Because half the time it just tells you what they do. Or a miracle? Oh, my bad. I forgot what I'm looking for. I don't have it. 
Bernal sells it? Oh my god, I forgot to go talk to freaking Bernal. <laughs> Wait, did I? I don't remember actually, did I? Hello, Liam Neeson. There you are. No, I did talk Sorry to him. We're good, we're good, we're good. Of my battle hearts. Oh, he won't sell it yet. He sells it in the Volcano Manor. I know what you're talking about now. Either way, we want to buy him out anyway. Even if we have the things. He doesn't reveal the assassin part till later. Yeah, but we'll, we were at the Volcano Manor. We can, we can make him appear there. Um, okay. Lost skill of Stormvale, Stormblade. Interesting. Okay. Well, until we meet again. Bye, Bernal. Corin sells a miracle one. Assassin's approach? That must be later then. Because I I gave I bought everything from him. However, one thing I actually forgot about is we wanted to. Okay, hang on. I'm I'm like. As usual, I want to do multiple things at once. It's hard to do like one th one solid path in this game. Um, okay, Vare we can handle quickly. Like we can basically complete Vare's questline, barring the parts at Moog. Now, so let's do that. Wait, where's his helmet in Volcano Manor? Um, partially to hide his face, but also because it's more like he isn't wearing his helmet. You know what I mean? I th well, I don't know. I guess it depends on your on your perspective. But he is an assassin. He hides his face. But here in the shack, he is a war master who sells ashes. But in the volcano manor, he's an assassin who hides his face. <whistles> Bernal sells it. Yeah, yeah. But we have to get him at the volcano manor. He doesn't. He. That's what I'm. I'm talking about. We can't get it right now. We need to go move over there. But there's a couple other quest lines I want to acquire first. We'll talk about the assassin stuff too. But it's just really interesting. I feel like a lot of the stuff associated with Marika is stuff that is meant to protect life. The concealing veil, uh, the mimic veil is more just for fun, but still it, it can be used to save lives. It saved my life countless times. Ah, no, 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 no. I forgot. I didn't read it. <laughs> Fully reddened oath cloth died in a maiden's blood. The final trial is complete. Luminary Moog is sure to welcome you into his service as a knight who will lay the foundations for his dynasty. Can we talk about how this little iconography kind of looks like Moog's face, but drawn by like a like a child? Like the horns, I'm like, wow. And then you see the face and it just literally looks like... Do you see it? Like literally dot dot eye and then like a little V mouth. Like a chow from Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Or a bit like my boy Raph Snake, actually. Okay, compare Raph Snake. Click on it if you want to. Oh, sorry. I moved the cursor. Click on it so you can see it a little closer. And look at that face and tell me they don't have the same vibes. Did Vare draw this? Like, himself? Do you think? <laughs> okay, let's, <laughs> let's go to that. <laughs> It's also tricked poor souls to climb onto an elevator loaded with a barricade of logs. That was a very funny moment. Do we have that clip? Pretty sure it's a sigil. Yeah, it's a sigil that looks like Vare drew it. Why did Vare draw it bad? Is he the old woman from Spain? The one who tried to restore the the, the portrait of, of Jesus and then accidentally turned it into not, you know, good? Ah, my lambkin. You've completed your final trial. And with this, you are a formal inductee. A knight who will assist Luminary Moog, the Lord of Blood, in the establishment of a new dynasty. Now, give me your finger. This noble blood will be an immutable badge of honor once it settles inside of you. <laughs> Thanks, Vitamin IQ. It's one of my favorite clips, too. It's very funny. We give him our finger. And he 
puts the blood into our finger. It spreads, but the finger seems to be the central point of it because it affects our eyes. But I'll show you the oh, finger after this. Heavens. Clench your teeth or something. Oh, he just drops you. It's so funny. Never forget that feeling of agony, for it is what binds you to Luminary Moog, to all of us. <laughs> You have the sweetest scream, my lambkin. I want to stab you. Oh, another thing. You should have this. Thank you for the Pure Blood Knights medal. A medal granted by the new Moguin dynasty. With the power to grant audience with Luminary Moog, I've gone out of my way to provide one to you. If only it is not but time. You mustn't use it just yet. The meeting must wait until the Moguin dynasty commences. Luminary Moog yet slumbers beside the divinity. He seems pretty freaking awake to me. Endure a little longer. Ah, it is trying, but we must be patient. One day you will be elevated. Never actually time, right? Basking in love. Right, my lambkin? <laughs> Ominous Dark Souls NPC laugh. All right. So, we got the bloody finger. Like I said, look at this finger. It is our finger. Do you see how it fades to black at the top? Because it is literally our finger. This one's severed. This one's severed. The baby bloody fingers. This is also severed. This is a severer. This is also severed. The one we get for the recusants is severed. In fact, maybe it's one of Rikert's? I don't know. I'm not going to go that far. But it's severed. This one is our finger. The blood is in us. And now, as a consequence, our eyes. It's a little hard to see on this character. But, I mean, you can see that they're pretty freaking red. Looks like she hasn't slept in 500 billion days. Anyway, um, yeah. Yeah. So that's what's really cool about the bloody finger, is that it is literally attached to us, and that's what Yura means when he cuts off the finger. Um, Attempts an invasion of another player's world. If successful, you will arrive as an invader, bloody finger, with the objective of defeating the host of fingers of that world. Glistening blood has been siphoned into the nail of this finger. Its sickly pale skin feels nothing now, but the nail still aches with sweetest pain. So let's talk about what this blood is. Um, it is Moog's blood, but it has been augmented and changed by the Formless Mother. It is cursed blood. Um, Morgoth also has the same blood, which is why during his boss fight, he uses blood flame in phase two. But, but he recanted and sealed the cursed blood into his sword. Moog did not do this. Moog continues to use the blood directly because he has sort of taken on this idea of becoming a ruler and creating his dynasty and the divinity. He's created his own little fan fiction um, for himself. Uh, it's a self-insert fan fiction with, uh, with uh, shipping him and his um, half-brother, Mikola. Don't get me started. But that's what we got with him. The blood appears to behave in a vampiric fashion. Like the typical concept of a vampire, very few people keep their will when they are given the blood. I wonder if that isn't something also to do with Vare's quest for you. The ritual that he performs, it could be one of those, it's main character syndrome. That's why we never, you know, when we get rot, we can cure it. You know, when we get uh, the blood, we're fine. When we're frenzied, we can choose it. We can choose to get rid of it. Like, we're the main character, so we can make different choices. But, um, it could also be Vare chose Moog's blood. He retains his will. A lot of others don't. And it could be something in the, with the nature of how they accept the blood. If it's forced upon them, Moog controls their minds. They effectively become thralls. Um, so the fact that Vare, we, it kind of makes Eleonora a little suspect. Is she, does she retain her will based on this tier? It suggests to me, yeah, she does. Where did she get it? Cause it's, you know, it's a crystal tear formed over the ages. So how does it specifically purify, purify Moog's blessing? 
Self-insert fanfiction? Yep. I, I don't know if Omen Blood has anything to do with it, but it is highly possible because it appears that Moog and Morgoth... It, it could also be that they're royal and demigods, and that's why their blood is of use to the Formless Mother, or why they're able to accept the Formless Mother. But considering that Moog is able to give his blood and make other people thralls, I, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know if, it is, if the Omen has anything to do with it. But the fact is that... Okay, two things that suggest a link. One, no one else, Vare, um, Eleonora, we, none, no one takes on omen traits after the blood is given to us. So that suggests that it's not like spread to us, but the Albinarix grow omen horns. So the Albinarix, especially the little froggy ones, appear, they're literally like, silver tears they are made of blood effectively and i wonder if that has anything to do with it why their bodies undergo such a severe change because they are literally just little blood beings and when the blood infects them or when they touch the blood when when the blood infuses their being they grow omen horns just like moog but people don't seem to so it's definitely there's definitely something about the omen horns i just don't know how significance to how much significance to give that uh, omen curse is connected with an overabundance of unhappy spirits. The thing about the omen, though, is I don't think the omen is a curse. I think their mistreatment and hatred toward how they have been treated as omen has become a curse, right? There's like a little distinction there. We've talked about this a fair bit, but I think we gotta, we gotta realize that the omen are actually quite natural. Like, they come from nature in this world. It is only their treatment that has made them a curse. They're thrust into sewers, not allowed to... They're, they're raised like animals, worse than animals. They're hidden away. They're considered evil. They're considered vile. And then they take that, that resentment and it becomes part of their being. But I don't think they are inherently cursed. Are there any reasons women are born? No, they just, they're just natural. The horns were considered a sign of divinity in the time where the crucible was sort of the main religious focus in the world and now it's been, they've been maligned so there is something to the fact that you know unhappy spirits the concept of a curse that's what that's what the omen often have but it's not because they're omen it's because they have been cursed do you know what i mean like slight difference between the two um it's kind of, it, it's something that I've honestly realized fairly recently thinking and thinking about it because it's hard to ignore the mainline boss, Morgoth, who talks about himself and his omenness as a curse. But look at who he is. He's like the definition of a self-hater. He hates himself and his omen horns. Aren't created by Dung Eater? No, I thought that too. But if you look at Dung Eater, he literally wears severed omen horns not omen horns the omen horns being severed a representation of their of how people despise them and torture them is what he uses as the basis of his curse that he inflicts upon others it is not the omenness it is the curse of mistreatment marcus gets got the curse it's not a curse that's why yeah the crucible not talisman I don't have anything with the omen horns yet, but it says, uh, let me show you what I do have. Crucible knot talisman. A talisman fashioned from a bony knot that embodies the aspects of various creatures said to have grown on the human body long ago. A vestige of the crucible of primordial life born partially of devolution, it was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. There's something similar with the same dialogue referring to misbegotten parts like wings. Um, I don't know if there's one for omen off the top of my head, but I, I think that the omen are only reviled because people were told to hate them. Something causes it? Proximity to the crucible. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's the only thing. I know that Morgoth calls it a curse. He, he refers to it that way, but he's a definition of a self-hater. So, of course. But the omen horns are not inherently bad as far as we can tell. Morgoth defends Lane Dell despite Gold in order hating them. He also loves the Erd Tree, which is 
troubling in its own way, right? He means well. Morgoth is a really tragic character for this reason. Dung Eater is someone who's despised and then he uses that to identify with the omens. He's literally cosplaying as a as an omen, but a severed omen. So definitely, I, I think he takes on that aspect of his identity. But the thing is, he wears it when he's executed in the opening cutscene, the same armor. So it's probably from that. It's probably that perception of the omen as reviled that he internalizes. Now, you could, if he wore armor with unsevered horns, then sure. But I think it's the, the key hint there is that the horns are severed. The horns aren't severed naturally. That's the unnatural part that is inflicted upon them when they are babies. That is, that is what he wears, not straight up curled. And there's tons of other omen. Why doesn't he pick one, pick ones that don't have their horns severed? Because the omen is not a curse. It is their mistreatment that causes this. They got it because they were born close to the tree at the beginning and being in proximity caused it. But I don't think it's a literal proximity. It could be, but I think it's one of those like, I don't know. It's possible it could have happened to Godwin. I don't know. I don't know. Hate on their existence, literally an omen that the Golden Order is failing to maintain status quo. Also, to admit the omen are natural is a reminder of the Crucible. And the Crucible is now the Erd Tree. It is now in this new form. It is civilized. It is pure. It is golden. Any mention of what came before is to give power to the previous form of the Erd Tree, and that is unacceptable according to Golden Order Fundamentalism. Any lore containing connecting Morgoth to Moog to Godwin? Just that they were siblings. They were all, they all three were born of Godric, uh, Godric, Godfrey and Marika. Their names are interesting, two of them being the Moog, uh, the M names, and one of them being the God names. So it's interesting, but... Mm. Yeah, so that's another thing, actually. The fact that Mikola and Melania are born cursed is another reason that people go, oh, so that's why Moog and Morgoth are cursed. It's really easy to fall into that line of thinking. But I argue that that is, is one of the examples of the assumptions we have to question. We know why Melania and Mikola are cursed. It's for a very different reason. None of the children are cursed, except for those two. Moog and Morgoth are perfectly natural. No, 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 no. Omen curse is not a cancer. Because, you know, I, that, I, I, that's an understandable argument. Because it's like, wait, but, you know, cancers naturally can occur. Nah, Godwin, if we're talking about the concept of a, of a, like a tumor and like a growth, a uncontrolled growth that spreads and infects, it, it's Godwin. Yeah. And a third symbol only used when can casting the Omen Shackles. Ah, neat. Right, the Omen Shackles. I only have the one right now, I think, but... It's just for a split second. But it's neat, isn't it? It's so sad. Shackles were used to bind the accursed people called the Omen, and these ones were made to keep a particular Omen under strictest confinement. Though faint, the shackles still retain vestiges of power enough to trap the once-bound market on Earth, if only for a short time. Like, bro, they literally got shoved into it. They were royal children. And then their dad was sent away. Pretty much forced away, from what you can read. And I personally think that Radigan rolled up and was like, hey, I'm going to be your stepdad now. Anyway, you're hideous, unsightly, cursed, and a sign of the crucible. You're going in the sewer. And then on top of that, awful mistreatment of beings that I think were still children. They were shackled in a sewer as if it wasn't enough awful behavior. I really don't think Marika wanted it. I just think that there was no other choice. Karpatka? No, I don't know what that is. I don't think so, anyway. Alright, um... So that's... Vare, I just want to get that done real quick. Let's go talk, just uh, in case I forget. Let's get this lovely dialogue from Melina. Here and above. 
crucible is already a taboo and he, even if in godfrey's time i don't think so because he fought with god with crucible knights like literally the crucible knights are described as as his soldiers soldiers of godfrey so it's just if if they were revived like yeah i guess you could use anybody there's an argument made you'd use anybody as a soldier but you know Talk to Melina. Spoken echoes of Queen Marika linger here as well. Shall I share them with you? I'm interested. In Marika's own words, hear me, demigods. My children, beloved, make of thyselves that which ye desire. Be it a lord, be it a god, but should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken, amounting only to sacrifices. Notice the passive voice. She says, ye will be forsaken. She doesn't say, I will forsake you because you're weak little babies. She says, ye will be forsaken. And harsh, intense... As that is, it's easy to forget the starting line. The starting line, which is, "Hear ye, hear me, demigods, my children beloved, or my beloved children." I already forgot. The point is, she loves her children, but what will happen in this cruel world? Because this happens at the site of the shattering, the outer wall battleground. This was one of the first fights after the shattering war, most likely, or potentially. The way it's shown. No, this is this was a shattering. Because we see this, we see these things shooting out uh, perfumer goo. Which one's that? Whose symbol is that? A bird? Neato. Gaslight's gatekeeps and girl bosses. I really don't think this is a gaslight gatekeep girl boss situation in all seriousness. So I think that she realized she created a fucked up world and she knows the shattering has just occurred or is happening currently. And she goes, listen, children, I love you. You need to make something of yourself or you will be sacrifices. That's it. That's the truth. It's a harsh, horrific truth, but it's true, isn't it? And I don't think her saying it is inherently like, oh man, she's so bad, dude. Yeah, like, she kind of knows she fucked up and she spends a lot of time trying to fix it as best she can. And unfortunately, there are a lot of casualties and it's heartbreaking. But like, she's just stating facts at this point. How do you know it's not Marika propaganda from Melina? We don't, but Melina makes it very clear that she is doing this of her own volition and her own will. Now it's possible she isn't. It's possible that Marika is someone like Mikola. Like Mikola, she has the power to compel affection and she can control people. It is totally possible that she is influenced by her mother and has no thoughts of her own. But she really does seem to make her own choices. And I think that's really striking. In her form, when we see her post-frenzy, who is she then? Is she still Melina? Is she still Marika's daughter? We don't know, but in the form that we meet her, she seems to make her own choices. Recite verbatim the words of the specific churches. She closes her eyes, looks up, and channels. There's something she does that's very special, it seems. Um, Lucy, thank you so much for the resub. Thank you for seven months. Welcome back. Japanese word will say who is older. I'm afraid I don't know, Nola. Um, yeah, Moosey, welcome back. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, Godric's forces definitely were before they were driven off. So as far as we can tell, at some point, Godric was in the capital. I think it might have been Godifroy's forces. And there is a slight difference. Wait. Did I talk to Melanie here, or did... Why is there no dialogue? I, there's definitely dialogue here. What? Did, oh, maybe it's later? No. Did I goof up? No, you can come back and get the dialogue. There should be dialogue here. I didn't get it already. Uh-oh. 
That's troubling. Regal Almond Baron releases demons. Not quite demons. Sorry, that was a little while ago. Not not demons. Um, it releases the curse, the the vengeful, angry beings. Like yes, you could be like, well, the Regal Omen Baron, which is a sign of un the the Omen Baron horns are not cut because it's the royal. Well, it's still cursed. I'm pretty sure the description, unless I'm thinking of the of the severed one, it talks about like do not revile us or something something. Either way. Whether they have full-grown horns or whether they have severed horns, omens are treated like trash. So of course they're still going to have vengeful spirits and vengeful feelings rising up within them. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing there, really. Mark has to be one of the most intriguing characters Rom's ever made. I agree. Oh, I'll give it to Martin. I really think that's part of his influence, for sure. He... Seems to be able to write some interesting characters from what I've seen. So that part is pretty neat. But I really wonder, I really wonder how much it was from and how much was Martin. Because they write some interesting characters, but not one quite so complex for sure. King Calamy! Oh, thank you for two years! I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Uh, to the resubbers, please, may I introduce you to my newest emote, um... A harass snake. Please, use it with abandon. Kidding, by the way? I know sometimes I'm slaughtering enemies, but like... Well, since I'm pretty deadpan, I don't know, I'm pretty chill. Oh, god, I love seeing harassed <laughs> snake. Soldiers who serve Godric the Crafter were remains of the army that fled the royal capital of the Erdtree. Yeah, so Godric fled the Erdtree capital, but we wonder when. Um, okay, I would like to do the Hero's Grave at Altus. Because that has that is where you get a very interesting bit of lore about um Godifroy, who I believe might have been either allied with or uh an inspiration for Godric. They were both likely related, and the fact that they look so similar... Besides really messing a little bit with the idea of, you know, having a unique boss... Uh, maybe they're twins! I don't actually think that, but they're both grafted. The thing is, Godfroy, Godfroy was grafted when he attacked the capital. Godric was apparently not. When we see Godric in the... Um, one of the one of the Elden Ring story trailers. We see him apparently looking pretty normal, and I think that was when Oh, also very notably, according to Kenneth Height, Godric fled uh the Landell capital. He he hid um as a woman, he disguised himself as a woman. So if he was grafted at the time, I don't think that disguise would have been very effective. So he wasn't grafted at the time. He started grafting when he reached Stormvale. We do be Lauren tonight, people happy. So let me do... Uh, I'm, I'm picking up the this from the... Is this where the twerking lion is? Twerking lion, where are you? Not a child of Marika? Well, he's of the golden golden lineage. Either way, and likely so is Godifroy based on the name. Uh, here's the twerking lion. Hello. Oop, that's the wrong button. I love trying to use spells. Okay, I just want you to know that was the most cute input of my life. I'm trying to get freaking to the side of him. The tracking of enemies in this game will never not annoy me. Oh my god, I actually dodged something. It's a freaking miracle. <sighs> I 
I bother trying to switch weapons, dog? I lived? I sincerely thought I was dead. Um, 16 HP and a dream, gamers? <laughs> Not even close. Planned. Planned. Oh, wait. Someone asked me about the lion from the trailer. I'm so sorry. I totally forgot. If that was during stream, I completely forgot to answer that. It, it's like a lion dance or whatever. Those, uh, those really cool things that they that people stand in and then they like do 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 and like parades and stuff there's people in it um i thought it was like a being despite looking kind of jacked up because i'm gonna be very 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 honest with you here a lot of enemies in this game look like they're being puppeted by something else and it's just the way they're animated it's like this uncanny valley animation style so that you know didn't trip me up i was like well their eyes look kind of glassy and it kind of looks like a mask and there's two sets of jaws but well that's from Zaf for you. Like, I thought the, uh, during the network test, I thought the Beastmen from Faramazula, the dogs, especially the super fluffy early dogs, and it's really just those two. I thought they looked like weird puppets being controlled by something else. So when I saw, like, this misbegotten with, uh, Crucible Knight armor. I just thought it was, like, an amalgam of Crucible bits. And I was like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Don't worry about why the eyes look so weird. That's just from soft. Turns out, nah, it actually is supposed to be a mask this time. Patron of that cut vengeance-based PvP covenant. Can't remember who raised his last stream. I did not see that, to be honest. Also, cut content. Girl, I don't know. Yeah, Mikkel is in there! <laughs> Purpose of a tarnish to slay gods and demigods? Oh yeah, the, the idea of the tarnish was absolutely pre-planned by Marika. So I wanted to go here. Perfect. Great. Let's fight Lansiax while we're here, actually. Yeah, the Revenants are... Well, I mean, they're cursed, creepy, weird, hollow, grafted beings, so... They're not supposed to look human either, but yeah, I see what you're saying. She planned to martyr herself to make up for her sin. Like a true, a true martyr in the sense of martyring herself because of her committed sin. Oh, you're really starting off strong today, baby girl, huh? I gotta tell you, I wish this lightning effect didn't hurt my eyes so much. It's really hard to appreciate it. Oh, good. I'm glad that I could see that coming. Is to a god of vengeance? Don't think it has an answer. Yeah, it was cut. Also, they have so many PvP-based covenants, too. In, in covenants in quotations there. Was it Valka? It sure was Valka. It could just be that they were gonna do another Control-C, Control-V from Dark Souls, like they kept blues in. In the form they were in Dark Souls 3, which makes zero sense in this game. And then instead of giving them a covenant, they were just like, I'll oh, just control C, control V. And then they realized, let's not do two control C, control Vs. And they removed it. Although technically she was the goddess of sin, sorry. Valka was the goddess of sin, but there was definitely a concept with her related to vengeance. Oh, fighting ancient dragons. Not poggers. 
I just, I, I freaking, I love your wings, but goodness me, you're a nuisance, aren't you? Hunters don't have any lore in this game, and even your summons is yellow, not a blue. Yeah, because they make zero sense. Like, genuinely. I really, keep in mind, I like blues and Dark Souls 3. They have a purpose, they make sense, they have lore. They fulfill a role, both in terms of gameplay and in terms of, of lore. It, they, they are perfect. They make sense. The way this game is constructed with its online component and the way PvP works, blues make no sense. In Dark Souls 3, first of all, you have to make a slight choice. Okay, I think it's the lightning that gets me a little irritated. It's like too much stimulation for my sen senses. The, the lightning hurts my poor eyeballs. And then constantly I hear flash, flash, blah, blah, crash, thunder, thunder, thunder. And I'm just like, I want this to end, please. And it makes it hard to enjoy this freaking seizure fest. I feel like I'm getting yelled at. Anyway, sorry. Hard to, move, hard to keep my train of thought. What? She don't tell. Um, yeah. So, the reason I talk about this, though, in, in Dark Souls 3 and in the other games, they take on different rules. I just know Dark Souls 3 relatively well, so I'm going to comment on that one. But in Dark Souls 3, you could get solo invaded, and it was... Oh, great. I'm so glad that there's you here now. Today I learned Lanciax is a freaking ganker? Okay, okay, cool, cool. Is the goddess of sin and repentance and repercussions way, not a committing way. She's also an adorable cat. She is. I also named one of my uh, ESO characters Valka. We talking Elden Ring Blues? Elden Ring Blues. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. These two sentinels weren't gankers? No, no, no. In none of the Dark Souls games were they the way they are now. Now, let me explain the difference. I'm going to focus on Dark Souls 3 because the way they work seems control C, control V from Dark Souls 3. So, generally, the Dark Souls 3, uh, you could get solo invaded, You and it happened when you were Ember. To Ember was sort of to become human. It was, uh, it would occur after bosses. Anytime you cleared a boss, you would become Ember, and you would use Embers as a consumable to enter this st uh, status as well, so that you could summon um, help. So you had to be Ember to summon, but even being Ember would make you susceptible to invaders. Not, not the summon. In other words, you might be a solo host on your first playthrough of the game, and the way that the Covenant, the Blue Covenants, were, were treated as helpers to protect new people and, and the weak. And that's what they do. Now, were Blues sometimes joining ganks? Yeah, for sure. It was. It, there were times where there were already um, two people in the world. And then you got uh, another blue coming in. But fair play, because they had to choose a covenant to do that. They had to select a covenant. They can't just use an item that has no consequence or currency and get someone to show up. In this game, compare... To get invaded, you have to be cooperative. So you have people who already have a friend, as a rule, and they're getting another friend? You're always going to be in a in at least a 2v1. And if a blue rolls up, it's automatically a 3v1. But Raph, if you use Tantra's Tongue... I'm not talking about the Tantra's Tongue. The Tantra's Tongue is a choice you make. The way it works by default is not like that. They make absolutely zero sense in this game. They have no place. And it retroactively damages the concept of them. In my opinion, to have them the way they work in this game. Also... There was a six-player online limit in Dark Souls. In this game, it's only four. This is taking forever. If you're a blue, you also had to roam around with the Covenant on, which gave up benefits. Yeah. There was a conscious choice involved. You can't just... Oh my god, I'm getting invaded! Let me use this item with no consequences. You had to choose, at a bonfire, what your Covenant was. You could change it easy, but you had to be at a bonfire. You can't do it on the fly. At least... Wait, oh, no, I think you can change it on the fly. Can you? 
This part I might be misremembering. It's been a while since I played Dark Souls 3 very regularly. Soul invasions are so much better. Like, in terms of you being... Like, keep in mind, I liked the concept of Dark Souls 3 because I would sometimes invade someone alone, and I would sometimes invade two people, and sometimes I would invade three. And it was like, you never know what you're going to get. Box of chocolates, as they say. Am I right? But now, without fail, the invasions are kind of stagnated. There's always going to be a host. There's always going to be an overleveled phantom. And there's always probably going to be a third. And if the host is dying, they're going to summon their friend. And then there's going to be another blue. And it's like, yikes. That was a bad dodge. Shit. Whoa! Gaming. And I'm probably dead. No fire. No fire. No fire. I specifically asked for no fire. Ah! Bro, if I die now, I'm gonna be a little bomb. This is taking 10,000 years. Well, we'll just come back. We'll do another time. But I really would like to defeat you so that I could cross you off my freaking mental list. <sighs> Are you fucked? There is no shot that was a good hitbox. The invisible hand killed me. Must have been Erden. It was Erden! Oh, send to Erden Chapel. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no problem. It's just, you know, the messiest hitbox on a giant enemy that literally didn't appear on my screen. It's fine. It's fine. If the chest was a hitbox... And that's bullshit as well, because the thing is, it's the arm that's fucking moving. Elven Ring. Return to the beating bosses, get Rune Arc and Embered in the DLC? No, probably not. They've already kind of committed in this in this direction. I don't mind this. I don't mind, like, you know. I really like invasions in this game. It's just a little depressing how quickly they've stagnated compared to Dark Souls 3, which is at this point, what, like a seven, eight year old game? It feels like it has more variety within it in ter and more life within it in terms of an online community. Miyazaki is actually a genius. Elden Ring is a story about stagnation of the world and its inhabitants. He decided to do storytelling within gameplay by making invasion stagnant and repetitive. That's smart. Exactly. Also, Mimics. Yeah, I miss Mimics. I really do. I miss them so Oh my god, I was so concerned. I was like, where did my flasks go? I was on the blue. <laughs> that was a good dodge. Blues and Dark Souls can evade those in the Book of the Guilty? Yeah, so that's the other thing. In Dark Souls 1... Now, keep in mind, I didn't do Dark Souls 1 PvP at all, so this this is outside my purview. But the way they worked in Dark Souls 3, uh, Dark Souls 1, sorry, you could get, uh, was it indicted? So if you invaded somebody, uh, they could indict you. They could be like, I am got freaking invaded. Ugh. And then they could, like, you know, put you on the list of the, in the book of the guilty. And then you would become a target for invasions from blues. So blues were invaders that were getting vengeance for people who were killed by reds. In other words, not gankers without friends. Super cool concept. Just, I'm very late to the game of Dark Souls 1. And it's, it's... PvP didn't really interest me. Conceptually, absolutely. I just was like, ah, I'd rather do like Dark Souls 2 or something. Dark Souls 2 blues, I'm actually not sure how they work. They're, but Dark Souls 2 has so many different covenants that it's really neat. All right, so this... This looks like the Holy Hand Grenade of Antioch, but instead of a grenade, um, it's um, a tree. Additionally... Lion? Question mark? No, it's probably just stone. Hee <laughs> hee, decorative, you know? Miss getting invaded by blues? I wish I was around for that. I would love that. Genuinely, it seems so fun.
Because then you would invade others and they get PvP and then you could get invaded and get more PvP. It's PvP all the way down, baby. Why in the world is the Elden Beast fighting us? Because what we are going to do to the Elden Ring is no bueno. Back when blues were cool? Genuinely. Genuinely. In this game, they're all bad. All bad. Here's the thing. I know some people go, oh, but they can... Sometimes you blue and then you self deceive so that, you know, you become a flask delivery service. And I respect your hustle and your grind set. But the only problem that I have with that is there's no way to tell when... A blue shows up whether they are going to be cool or they're going to be a dingus and 99.9% .9 of the time they're a dingus. I've only, I think I've only encountered one uh, free flask refill intentionally blue and it's kind of a bummer. Sentinels would come for you after you had some red invasions. It was so cool. Neat. Uh... Ah! A revenant. Could this be why this was locked away? Crimson Seed Talisman. This is the talisman I was thinking of previously, actually. I wanted to talk about this one. A crimson colored talisman patterned after an Urtree seed. The Urtree was once perfect and eternal, and thus was it believed that Urtree seeds could not exist. Then why the heck did you make a seed based on one, you idiots? What if it's simply great tree seeds? Like, what if the Ur tree was eternal and stagnant, but before, in the form of the Crucible, it had seeds, which is what that, those were patterned on, and why there are minor Ur trees? Because they were simply saplings. Maybe that's what it is. No, no, man, I don't want to go that far. I don't think it's that. I genuinely, like, FromSoft, if they wanted no invasions, they would simply cut them. They have kept them in and kept PvP in, but I think the issue with Elden Ring is uh, major development issues, um, open world, huge scope. Also, they wanted to make it more accessible, so they put it on previous gen consoles, PS4, Xbox One, and that means that this is a huge game. Imagine six people in a world with everything that's going on in an open world. That's a lot. I actually don't think it's one of those like, yeah, from is trying to appeal. I literally just think that they, uh, it was a limitation of the technology and they had to do that. So the four, so many problems would be solved if it wasn't a four player limit, genuinely. But to make their game work and to make it more accessible to people, because the P remember when this game came out, the PS5, uh, and the Xbox Series S or X or whatever were, like, n impossible to find. And yeah, you could play on PC, but how many people have PCs, right? Like, not everyone does. I was exclusively a console gamer. So how many people would have not been able to play the game? Um, so, you know, it's just, that's why they did it, and I understand. It's just, the blues bother me because of it, because it worsens the quality of the PvP experience. Ah, here's the line I was looking for. Shadow bathes in light and knows weakness. I don't know if that's true, because the thing about light is that it must also cast a shadow. Seeds could be a consequence of removing rune of death. No death maybe means no saps and seeds. The thing is, we know that it, the golden seeds appeared when the Elden Ring was shattered. And if they drew, the, uh, if not drew, but if they created these talismans patterned after an earth tree seed, where did they get the design if this occurred during the shattering? Unless this was made post shattering. Maybe it was made post shattering. That's totally possible. Why can't we call up with horses in open world? Probably for the same reason, actually. So that's why it's a four player limit with no horses. Then I had six players in Scholar of the First Sin. I actually didn't know that. That's really neat. I, I don't know all the differences between uh, base DS2 and Scholar, unfortunately, so. Yo, Dean, what's up? Make rune arcs function as embers? Yeah. The thing is, I think it's because you have to choose a rune arc versus embers operate the same. Yeah, that's right, you better leave. Oh, that's right, you better come back. Oh, you better leave. Oh, you better come back. Oh, shit. Oh, you bet. <sighs> okay. Really? What kind of teleports behind you nonsense was that? Nothing personnel, kid. 
I, I keep looking. I keep trying in my heart of hearts. Hello. Goodbye. Can't help but notice this place is like, oh, you got a lot of shadows around here. Where the heck am I? I don't remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember this place at all. I just did this on stream, I thought. Uh, not on stream, on my first playthrough, but I don't remember what the heck I just did. Um, but no, I really wonder if Revenants are gonna perhaps play some sort of role in the DLC. I'm not certain, but it is a little interesting that we get this mention of shadow and light. In practice, it's just meant to be a hint that these guys are shadowed and therefore cannot be hurt, but in the light, they become vulnerable. This is an Erd Tree seal, like the golden the golden order seal, I should say, isn't it? What am I looking for? A talisman, a weapon? I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something that I don't remember what it is. It's like it's got that symbol on it. Golden Vow. Ah, so specifically Golden Vow. Wait, Golden Vow? Really? Weapon, caster, seal? Yeah, I'm like a freaking... I'm having a bra moment today. <laughs> Where are my seals, dog? Shortcut. It's different. That's the Golden Order Fundamentalist symbol, though. Um... That's God Slayer, Claw Mark, Dragon Communion. I don't really have like. I guess we look at incantations. Let's look at my incantations. I might have something with that symbol. Did you read the Black Knife? I sure didn't. Thank you for the reminder. Let's do that. Um, once I try to find where this freaking symbol is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Incantation of Erd Tree Worship. Yeah, so it's an Erd Tree symbol. Represent This represents the Erd Tree. So it's the light of the Erd Tree cleanses the shadow. Interesting, isn't it? The Black Knife. Dagger once belonging to one of the assassins who murdered Godwin the Golden on the Night of the Black Knives. A ritual performed on the oddly misshapen blade imbued it with the power of the stolen rune of death. So, taking a look at this blade. Um, you see how it's literally, like, it looks like someone took a knife to the knife and tore it kind of apart all over. I really wonder if that wasn't the sort of messiness that occurred with imbuing it with the power of death. Like it literally, they cut it and just kind of poured the power of death in there in this sort of messy way. Like they look cool. The weapons themselves, real cool looking. Wow, I didn't realize they like jut out in that direction. It could also be an aspect of the blades already, but I wonder because weapons that are also, oh my God, I never fought the, I don't have the flowing sword. I was gonna compare with the flowing sword, another eternal city weapon. I don't know, it's just a, it's just a design thing. I'm not certain that that's what it is, but I, can, I can't help but say this is like a really, it's really jaggedly cut, you know? Urtree still is the one in Volcano Manor Town. I just haven't been there yet. Very impractical blade IRL. I love impractical IRL blades. They've been using the creation of the Black Knives, the Finger Slayer blade. Right, it is very similar. The thing is, I think the weapons were already theirs, right? It's just they changed to... Okay, I feel like I've gone somewhere weird here because I don't remember it looking like this. Where the heck am I? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the Finger Slayer blades look similar, so I think it could be, but I think it was just their weapons. I wonder what their weapons looked like beforehand, before they were turned into the, the Black Knives, because they seem to be very adept with them. So to me, it sounds like they took their weapons and added something to them. Although, Ronnie specifically in this case, Ronnie is the one who did it. She's the one herself. <gasps> oh my freaking goodness. I forgore. <laughs> Can 
Nice zone five. How nice. Shape of the black knife print you get in Lyurnia as part of Rogera's quest. Ooh, what about it? Does it match up perfectly to the Finger Slayer blade? Wait, what is this? So, I've done this before. In fact, I edited me, myself, doing this recently on my first paper, and I don't... I... this... this... has no familiarity to me. I feel like I've never been here in my life. They match it very, very closely. Do they not with other... Do the black... wait. So do you think the process warped them? We gotta compare it with the Finger Slayer Blade. I haven't acquired it this playthrough yet. I just really wonder, would Ronnie... well... Doesn't that suggest... so you're suggesting that the Black Knives weapons looked a lot more like the Finger Slayer Blade until the Rune of Death? Because that warped them. Is that what you're saying? We can't really think of like what is real in terms of weapons like that because I agree they looked really they look really warped. And there's this oh they, they can't be signed like that. But we also have weapons that literally flow like swords in this game, so you know. From the use of the finger slayer blade and making the black knives. Okay. Interesting. The one sort of counterpoint I have is if Ronnie... Okay, Ronnie did know about finger, finger Slayer. Well, did she know about it? She did. No, she did. Because she asked you to get the hidden treasure of Nakron. So she knows what it is. And even where it is. But if she had it in her hand in order to do the, the Knight of the Black Knives, then why wouldn't she keep it? Hang on, I want to hold on to this just in case we need to make more black knives, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe that's how she found out that it exists. Erdsteel Dagger from Melina? The Erdsteel Dagger? Melina is able to use a very similar Musa. I think we gotta do some weapon comparisons. Unfortunately, at this point in the playthrough, I don't have these weapons yet. They maintain possession of it? Clever. Smart. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Let's get to it! What up, gamer? Oh, Ow. That really hurt. Come. Blade of Calling? Sorry. Yeah, the Blade of Calling. But the Earthsteel Dagger has some similarities. But, you know, still different. Where is it? Is it this way? Oh, son of a... I don't remember. I know we gotta lead this guy into the light. I just don't remember where the light is. Well, not that way, clearly. It's here! I remember. Doubt they give it to Ronnie. Ronnie's the one who, who, who created the fingerprint, but she might not have had access to the weapon forever. Yeah, for sure. Come, come, come. Oh my god. Come. Come! Idiot. I'm sorry for my harsh language. I gotta go up there too. Oh no, he's stupid. Ow, okay, that was a little karmic. <laughs> Who's stupid? Who are you calling stupid? Come here. What are you doing? Help, help, help. Oh, 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 now you're backing away, huh? Oh, oh, typical duelist. Who are you gonna call? Freaking blues? You can say hello to your blue friend in freaking hell. Okay, bye. Thank you. Eh. <laughs> 
Oh, I done goofed. Wee! Oh. Bye. Yo, Adorno-san, thank you for the three consecutive streams watched. Stream streak. So these guys actually use a uh, a bell, uh, a spirit calling bell. It's a specific one, though. We actually should go get it in the urinia. I just haven't taken that path yet. It's right near the Lascar ruins. Neat. There we go. What else is sealed away now that I think about it? Ooh. What you guys looking at? Dragon Crest shield talisman plus one. Interesting. Elden Ring or Dark Souls weapon in real life, would you choose? I don't know. I like Nebula a lot. Oh my god. Or the the threaded cane. But the threaded cane I feel wouldn't translate that well to like display because the point is that it's transforming. Maybe the Rukuyo because I have a soft spot for Lady Maria. I am so lost. I don't think I was as lost as I as I I'm so lost. I wasn't lost and then I am kinda now. Oh dear. I thought I saw the door when I was with the duelist, but now I don't remember where that was. Then again, I found some new stuff, so we're fine. This is where I fell through the floor. And we're back in a big circle, which is good. That's promising. This guy, the reason I want to do this particular uh, hero's grave is because I think this is where we get the guy who defeated Godifroy. Interesting, well, fine. Yeah, I really wonder about the real world inspiration for some of these. I really, I really think the inspiration was partially for the wandering mausoleums was the wing two stars, and I really hope they do more of that. But it may not have been the the, win, the wing two stars, but the wing two stars are famously the ones who have winged armor like that, right? I hope they take more Polish influence. I want to see some Slavic stuff in FromSoft, dog. Hello, Ancient's Hero of Zamor. That's awkward. I don't have a lot of healing, and I don't remember how to get to you, and you're not the chillest. Oh, Ram, how could you say that? They are so chill. They literally use ice magic. <laughs> well, you got me there. Chat, you mean bean? Do you see that disrespectful head ass? Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what weapon I would pick. I like a lot of different weapons in these games. Oh my god, did my I forgot to use spells and I'm like, I'm gonna use more spells. Oh, again. Jerk. Come here. Get cooked. Here we go! Ancient Dragon Knight Kristoff. That might be why if other- if these sort of zombies shambling around are other Dragon Knights or what's left of them, then it makes sense. So, Ancient Dragon Knight Kristoff. Legendary Ashen Remains. Used to summon the spirit of Kristoff, the Ancient Dragon Knight, and right next door is a spirit caller church to this area. Lanciax is right nearby too. Spirit of Kristoff, an honorable knight of Landell, who was also a devout worshipper of the ancient dragons. His skills strike down foes with thunderbolts, the dragon's weapon of choice. After the first defense of Landell, Kristoff earned the hero's honor of Urtree burial for the feat of capturing Godfrey the Grafted. So we get a lot of interesting lore about this. First of all, I know Godfrey, I know, I know, it's sort of this weird thing, but. We kind of get a little bit more context with item descriptions like this. Godifroy attacked the capital of Landell. This was the first defense of Landell. At this point in time, we don't know where Godric was, but I theorize that he was still in Landell as part of the alliance, because he is listed uh, by Morgoth in the cutscene. And then 
uh, Godric at some point stole the Mimic Veil, an ancient treasure of Landell associated with Marika, Marika's mischief, and uh, snuck out of the castle dressed as a woman. Some people think the, the Mimic Veil may have been how he did this. It's possible, but we only see it allow you to transform into inanimate objects. However, that could be gameplay. It's possible that he otherwise, that it can make you transform otherwise. However, when we see Godric, he looks quite cute. Like, he could totally, probably, like, he has long hair. He's not quite like Mikola, but you know what I mean? Like, he's kind of got that, like, androgynous look. You could argue he's very, very petite, very, very small. You see him only for a flash in this, like, story trailer, but it's pretty neat. So, I theorized that Godfrey attacked, and then perhaps Godric had something to do with the attack. Maybe he sighed with Godfrey. I don't know. But at some point, he snuck out, went to Stormvale, started grafting himself. Godfrey was the one in the Everjail. Yes. So now we know who trapped him. It was Kristoff. Um, didn't mind this dungeon? I really like this dungeon. I love the... Uh, hero graves honestly i found this one like a little forgettable i might have missed some stuff in here though i really i have no memory of this place it's so strange because i just edited this and i went through it but i feel like i remember bringing like a shadow up so that i can take out enemies or something but maybe i remember activating something and it went like all the way up and then there was a secret alley i don't know man <laughs> but either way the important part is Kristoff and how it relates to god of Roy's lore We'll fight Lance Yannick's another time. Let's go to the round table. We'll see what's up. Godfrey's Evergel at the Caria Manor? It's an Altus. Which one are you thinking of? It's actually right at the entrance. Uh, if you go Dectus. Yeah. I don't like the Rolling Pins of Death. My favorite is the, um, the Rolling Pins of Death. Connection between Zamor and Kristoff. The Zamor, as far as we can tell, we don't know a lot about them. They're kind of mysterious. Um, they didn't like the giants. It's possible they sided with um, the Golden Order slash the, the Earth Tree, I should say, because of this. However, this talisman. Radigan's Scar Seal drops from the ancient hero of Zamor who is locked away in an Everjail in the Weeping Peninsula. So that's that's kind of where the idea comes from. Maybe they worked for Radigan, maybe they just worked for the Golden Order. That's really far south though for a Zamor who exists on the mountaintop of the Giants. They're otherwise pretty scattered and the only thing we know is the Zamor ruins, which literally are about the size of any other ruin. Like, they are pretty small, and that's the only hint of the Zamor that we get in terms of where they lived, and we know they were enemies of the giants. I think there's probably some more lore about them, if we really look, but generally, from what I recall, they are sort of mysterious. We know they hated the giants, and several ancient heroes of Zamor fought at various places. So the, this one at Altus, is he protecting the grave? Is he not? We don't really know. He's just kind of there. Hailed as heroes in the war against the giants. Well, there we go. Yep, they sure did fight against the giants. It's really interesting that some of them ended up fighting with Radigan, though. Having Radigan's Scar Seal and being all the way... It's right here. Weeping Everjail. Like, we can't even see them out on top of the giants yet. Some more ruins is, like, here? And it went all the way here. Really interesting. Although that one seemed to, like I've said, serve some more. Yeah, I believe there's one in the in the the ancient hero grave up there. Like those mag magma blades. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to like be a little bit more aesthetic so that Mesmer will like me. I do have to get the blasphemous blade, but we haven't done Volcano Manor yet. Mesmer isn't a grafter? Oh, I doubt it. No, no, no. Oh, because the snakes? No, absolutely not. I think he was either born that way or... I don't know. I don't think he was a grafter. I think we gotta think a little bit more about Rikard. So from what Rikard found, which I think it was Mesmer's relics and things related to Mesmer, he started eating others. 
And that's interesting, considering it looks like uh, Mesmer engaged in dragon communion, eating dragon hearts. So he eat, ate things. And um, I don't know, we, we still have a lot of questions. When they get like two lines of dialogue uh, from him, how did Hugh know Marika? We can only speculate. I think they may have learned blacksmithing together. Maybe he taught her. Um, maybe vice versa. I really don't know. He was definitely a smith. He knew her. Um, he now worships her as a god, but I really get the vibe they knew each other before that. And that's another reason that I don't really buy the Marika and Godfrey hated crucible things. Because we know he has, she has a link to Hugh, but we don't really know the nature of that. It could just be he was convenient and and she used him for his his ability to craft. But I don't know. I really wonder. We know that she was mischievous. She seemed to have a good nature. The Golden Order changed her. Becoming a goddess changed her. But I wonder who she was before that. The sheer terror of her, though. He's talking about a god at that point, for sure. Roderica's friends want to get crafted? They didn't. They just freaking lost. Maybe he's born with it. Maybe it's snake belly. Rat, hmm. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Thanks for the under bits, full time. All right, gamers, I'm going to call it here. I know it's really early, but I got to be up early tomorrow for an appointment. I have two doctor's appointments in two days, and I'm not excited, but I need to get some rest a little earlier today. So I might stay up a little bit more to edit, um, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to edit an episode this weekend because of how long Saturday and Sunday episodes took me. So the YouTube first playthrough, ow, Bandai, might be a little delayed. We'll see. But either way, is Marika the spirit tuned to Hugh remembers? I think so. But there's some debate. I personally think so, though, yeah. Either way, sorry, it was re it's really short. I don't like streaming for such a short time. I know we're having such such fun. Um, there we go. But I'm not a morning person. I got to try to make it as painless as possible, as they say. This is a long week, so ugh, not looking forward to it. I somehow managed to schedule like every single um, medical appointment that I have within a week of each other. So I have like four different things going on in a week. <laughs> uh. <laughs> When's the next stream? Tuesday. It'll be on Tuesday. So, um,. Please, uh, you know, follow on Twitch. That's how you get noticed. But sometimes Twitch is finicky. If you don't want to miss more of the Lorathon, join the Discord, follow on Twitter, etc. That's where I do go lives as well. It's not a really short stream. That's true. I think it's short because especially lately I've been going way longer. So it just feels really short. I hate ending like earlier than normal. You know what I mean? Man, this music is freaking crazy, isn't it? I love it. I really do. It just... Oof, you know? Thanks for that, Lyco. I appreciate that. Four and a half hours? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. Oh, I had so much to do this week and I didn't finish everything. But wish me luck tomorrow. And I will see you on... Th to Tuesday? Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. I'm just going to call it. Um, no raid today. I just, you know. Here. Snake with me. Goodbye, everybody. Sweetie. Later, Snake. Either. Yes. Yes. Snake! Squid! I'm sorry, YouTube chat. There's animated emotes. I'm afraid animated emotes don't work. So you're probably like, what the heck is going on? One day you will see. <laughs> Bye, everybody. So long, and thanks for all the snakes.